Okay, all. I hope I'm live. Looks like I'm live. Can I see everybody? I think so. Let me know if you guys can see me and hear me. Hopefully you can. Give me a yay. I have to lean over. My comments are like really tiny. <laughs> um, I don't see anybody yet. Hopefully. Let me know if you give me a thumbs up if everything looks good. And my audio is working and it looks like everything's good here. And I'm hoping that you all can see me. Yes, yes. Oh, cool. Excellent, guys. I see you. Wonderful. Good to have you with me. Oh, I do have my phone with me. So um, anyone who who has my cell phone and I have technical issues, please give me a ring. Uh, I will be. Um, this is my new audio rig. It's a very heavy microphone. So so I have to check to make sure it doesn't drop like down. <laughs> So that'll be amusing. That'll be a fun little diversion if that happens. You will see me very quickly jump off the camera <laughs> and fix it. Um, thank you so much for, for being with me, all of you. Um, looks like everybody can hear me well. And yes, my mic issue should be over. For those of you who are in the know, I had to go, I had to completely get rid of the frequency range I was in. I had to jump onto a much higher frequency range because I think it was somehow interfering with, with some, that we had some electromagnetic interference that just was not handling any, or uh, not dealing with any mic issue, or excuse me, not allowing any mics in a particular frequency range to um, function without horrible static. So it looks like things are fixed. We shall find out because, you know, as these, as you know, these mini courses last a little while. Now, to address that, by the way, anybody who is watching the mini course today, or even if you're watching it on replay, do not feel you need to take this all in one gulp. This is this is a month long uh, period you know, that I'm trying to catch up people on. So because I only do these mini courses once a month, that means I pack in a ton of information. So please feel free to take breaks. Do not feel that you need to sit through this in one sitting. If you do, kudos to you. You are an absolute um, marathon runner, and um, I, I, I applaud you. But I've had many people tell me, Tamitha, I just can't sit through the whole thing. Don't feel badly. I, <laughs> I don't expect you to, because it's a lot of information. And the nice thing is that we are going to be jumping into a new uh, series now. This is the beginning of um, what I call the Second Chef series, and I'll get to what that means in just a second. First of all, I want to say thank you to all of you who are it, coming in and joining us live. This is fantastic. Um, oh, good. And everybody's saying my new lav mic sounds amazing. Thank you, Cicada. I appreciate that. Or Cicada? Cicada? Ooh, Cicada Emergence. That's kind of cool. That's a neat name. Um, I see lots of people that I know. Hi, Chris. Hi, Mike. Hi, Simplio. Good to see you all here. MM, MM6KHA, thank you so much. Um, and uh, I see Jerry Ryan and Mike Richardson. They are the moderators. They are my VIP. There are several of my VIPs, which you will see on this side. <laughs> um, you'll see them in the list here. Uh, they are part of my VIP steering committee, and they uh, will help answer any questions. They are very knowledgeable about space weather, and they are very knowledgeable about the Patreon project in general. Uh, because they help steer the ship, along with all these other wonderful VIPs who have joined us. And um, and and they are part of what makes this whole, the whole space weather courses and forecasts and everything else possible, along with, of course, all my mini course people. These are people who support me uh, to do the mini courses. They help decide what content we're going to be presenting and in the order we're going to do it, they, they, they give me questions and, and help me better the content that I already have. As a matter of fact, the last mini course I did a little while ago, um, I beefed up a ton because of questions that all my mini course patrons had given me. So it was very, very wonderful. Um, you know, I appreciate all of, all of these people. Every single one of them is part of my extended family. And if you want to be part of the Patreon project, please feel free. Join. I, I don't think I have a link in the, in the chat or anything. Um, or a link in the description, but you can easily find me by just going to Patreon and looking for Space Weather Woman. That's a wonderful uh, project, and we are um, going to be ramping up uh, here as Solar Cycle 25 gets underway. So things are going to get much more exciting very soon. Also, one more little side note, if anyone is wondering, yes, my family member is still in the hospital. I think we're getting closer to discharge, but this has been 
the most one of the most brutal times in my life since basically the beginning of the year. So um, we're over three months now, and it has, as as even all my Patreon family know, it has taken a huge toll um, on on me and on my family. Um, but we, I think, we're finally going to get through it. So whew, let's hope. Let's hope. So things should be a little bit better from here on out. Um, and I think I think I can with that. If there are any questions. Or anybody have any issues from a previous course or anything like that? I'm going to jump into this material here really quickly. So one quick check uh, uh, in the chat just to make sure. Tamara, the standing by on phone duty. Thank you, Jerry. I appreciate that. Yes, I, I have I have my ringer on. <laughs> and yes, Jerry, thank you for putting the um, Patreon uh, my Patreon link in the chat. That's very kind of you. So anybody who's interested, just check it out. Uh, there's lots of stuff that's there um, just even just if you follow me. It's not even, you know, you don't even have to like join officially. You can just follow and you get a lot of good stuff. So because um, that, that calls that calls you a patron. Um, you are a patron of Patreon, even if you just follow me. So um, thank you so much for the for the love for my um, for my family members. And I appreciate that very much. And uh, yes, thank you. Um, Hasty as well. Okay, full steam ahead. Everybody's ready. Thank you, George. I appreciate that. And Robert, oh, good. I'm so glad you're here, Robert. That's nice to see you. Um, when do you see the start of Solar Max? Oh my gosh. You know, man, it's getting infuriating, isn't it? Solar, we are in Solar Cycle 25 for anybody who's been wondering. We are in Solar Cycle 25. We've been in Solar Cycle 25 since a bit, since the beginning. Well, essentially the end of, um, oh my gosh, what was it? 2019? <laughs> We've been in solar cycle 25 for a while now, but it's um, it's unbelievably slow ramp up. And part of that we know is the northern hemisphere just dragging its feet. But uh, the southern hemisphere looks like it's been wanting to, to go to, to ramp up activity for quite some time now. And that's why you see most of the active regions in the, on the sun, most of them in the southern hemisphere. As of late, we're seeing more in the northern hemisphere, but they're just little teeny tiny guys. So um, it's still fighting. It's still fighting to, to get all of that old flux just through and done with so that it can, it can be left only with solar cycle 25 flux. This We're talking about magnetic flux at the high latitudes. And once it gets rid of what let, with that junk that's left in the equator uh, region, then, then wham, we're going we're gonna to turn on. But to be honest, I'm kind of surprised um, how slow it's ramping up. And if this if this continues, likely the the solar cycle will be very much like solar cycle twenty four, um, and so we will be in yet another reasonably low activity cycle. And what will happen is uh, we will have again a, a large potential for big 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 events, right? And we are so overdue. I was actually hoping that we'd have a solar cycle that was going to be much larger uh, with solar cycle twenty five, as as several people have predicted. Um, because that would make the chances of us having those really big events that we're all kind of nervous about, it the chances of those go down. Um, but if we stay in the low activity cycle like we're in, the chances of us having a really big event is, is stays high. So, you know, it's one of those give and takes that I'm, I'm not super happy about, but it is what it is. So I'm hoping cycle 25 gets underway quickly because the longer it waits, the, the lower activity cycle and the more complex that magnetic field is likely to be. Um, so, cause that means that's the more out, out of sync the two hemispheres are, right? They're not in sync. The more out of sync they are, the lower activity cycle it is, but the more complicated the magnetic field structure is of the sun overall, and the more extreme events we can get. We may not get as many events, but we just, the ones that we do get can be far more intense. So it's, it's kind of a give and take there. Okay. So I answered that question and I think now is good time to talk about what happens when all of that solar phenomena, right, when you remember all of the courses I've given thus far have been what I've called the first chef, okay, this is the sun, basically. The sun has all this solar phenomena that it spews at us, right, through its solar cycles and all of that. And we have things like radiation storms. We have things like uh, coronal mass ejections. We have things like fast solar wind, right? And we have things like solar flares and radio bursts. And each one of those different phenomena I've gone over in prior mini courses, right? Um, and we called that the space weather basics. And I probably on YouTube will put that in its own category. That is what I call the first chef, okay? That's the sun creating this stuff, sending it out to us, kind of like throwing us eggs, 
right, for breakfast, right? Us, meanwhile, we're not in space. We're not out in front of the Earth's system. We are sitting inside the Earth's magnetic shield all the way down to the ground, right? So we have the Earth's, the Earth's magnetic system. We have the upper atmosphere and the ionosphere and, the, and the, the neutral atmosphere. And then we have the ground issues. And we are sitting here on the ground through all that stuff. And what we hold out our plate for breakfast, expecting to see eggs, right? We're expecting to see, um, you know, what the sun throws at us, right? Pristine eggs. Instead, what we get on our plate when when we hold it out to the sky is scrambled eggs. And we look at scrambled eggs and we know what an egg looks like. And we look at this stuff and we go, huh? What the, what is this? Right? How did it get from the pristine egg that the first, that the sun threw at us to this weird stuff that scrambled up and looks like a junk on our plate? And that is due basically to the second chef. Okay. The second chef is what I'm going to call the earth's the near earth system from basically the edge of earth's mag uh, magnetic shield all the way down to the ground okay that is the second chef and the second chef basically takes those eggs that the sun throws at us and right at the boundary of the earth's magnetic system that's like the crack of the pan <laughs> so the earth so the second chef cracks that egg at the pan at the edge of the pan which is the front end of the earth's magnetic system and drives it all the way down let me just show you here. So let me get off on this side. I've got my thing mirrored, so I have to remember that being mirrored makes me walk the other way. Um, so here's the first chef, right? The sun going all the way to about here, right? And this right here, the edge of the Earth system, this is the, this is the crack of the pan. This is the edge of the pan where that beautiful pristine egg goes crack, splits open, and gets thrown in the pan. <laughs> There's the pan. <laughs> We're going to call it regime one, okay? And the, you'll see re the reason for that here in a second. So hopefully everybody understands that, that what we've talked about with Space Weather Basics up to this point has been all that stuff that the sun has thrown all the way up to the edge of the Earth's magnetosphere, okay? And then we're going to start talking about all of this good stuff in here. So if you don't know all of this phenomena, all right, don't worry. You just go back to the to the mini courses. The, the material is there. Just go back to the mini courses on my YouTube um, you know, channel and and take a look at the at those mini courses. You'll find in the titles all the titles of all the different types of phenomena that we went through. Okay, and there's really only four main types, but we just went through it in a lot of detail. So first chef, second chef. This gets really interesting. And as you can imagine, in space weather, as I'm standing in front of this whole one chef, two chef thing, you can imagine people in my field, they are <laughs> they are so like focused on very specific disciplines that the people on this side that talk and deal with, with and study the first chef know very little about the second chef, right? Because they can spend their entire PhD careers, they can spend their entire scientific careers studying one little aspect of what the, the first chef does and not have a clue about the second chef, let alone all the terminology, all of the jargon, and all of the effects. Because you, as you'll see very soon, things get very complicated very quickly. Okay. So if you ever wonder why there's not a lot of people in space weather who seem to know everything from sun to mud, it's simply because there's just so much to know. And you can literally spend in academia, you can literally spend your entire life and never have to dabble to get away from either one chef or the other. There's very few scientists who actually do all of it. Okay. And even those people don't do typically don't do all of it. Like you'll see people with the first chef and they'll do the magnetospheric part, but they won't go down into the atmosphere into the ionosphere, and then they definitely won't go down into the neutral atmosphere, which is right, atmospheric or terrestrial weather right? You really don't see that all the way down. So it becomes extremely difficult to find experts who have this, this understanding all the way down through the neutral atmosphere to the ground. And over probably the course of, oh my gosh, we'll probably do in this series 10, probably, maybe eight to 10 courses, or many courses, uh, mini, yeah, many courses like this, before you get a full understanding of all the regimes. So just so you know, what the second chef does is as intense as what the first chef does, okay? And hopefully that makes sense to everybody. 
I need to take her course if she writes a book. I'd love to read it. I am going to. I am going to write a book. Yes. Um, this is just so you guys know, all of this stuff is the baseline point of departure for my Millersville courses that I do teach much more formally. These courses have a, most of the same material, but they're taught in a much more casual fashion. They take longer. I get strayed. You know, we, we, we diverge off of topics sometimes, just like I'm talking now. Obviously, I wouldn't be taking this much time with my Millersville students um, going off and talking off topic things. And then, um, and, but, but to be honest, all of this material will end up going into um, probably a, 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 a large text. <laughs> thinking of a better word. <laughs> no, there isn't one. Probably a decent sized text, um, but at, at, this, at this level, at a level that is for a non-expert necessarily, but also for, as I've learned, these, this kind of text can be for an expert that doesn't want to have an expert level of knowledge in the other regimes. They just want to understand it because there's a lot of experts that I've learned, um, even PhDs, that have taken a look at what I've presented and said, wow, now I understand what these guys are talking about. So I can now talk to scientists in this discipline much better because I understand what they're going after. Whereas before they didn't, um, even though I'm not teaching at that, at, at a PhD level, you don't need to, but we do need to get these different scientists to talk together. And so I think writing a book like that is very important, not just for meteorology um, as a whole and the non-expert alike, but also for experts who don't want to get a second PhD, but they do want to have a better, broader understanding of how the whole thing works, right? So that they can um, have a, a better chance to either cross-pollinate and, and do cross-disciplinary studies, or at least just understand what other other people in, in science in other regimes are looking for. So let me talk about that for a second. So to give you an outline of the Second Chef series, that's what I'm, I'm probably going to call it that. I don't know. If, if somebody has a better name than a Second Chef series, let, let me know. Put it in the chat or something. We're Patreon members. Let me know because uh, I don't know. It's cute, but it's kind of campy, right? So if we, if we like the campiness, then I'll keep it. But if not, you know, we can we can figure out something else. But oh, the overview of this of these is, is really we're going to talk about essentially three regimes. Okay, you can see four listed here. And the reason for that is because the fourth regime, right, or regime zero, is the one we've already talked about through space weather basics, right? Basically, space weather effects from sun to the nearest space. That was all the solar phenomena that we've already talked about, okay? Then regime one, right, is space weather effects in near-Earth space and inside Earth's magnetic shield. That's what we're talking about now. Okay, that's what we're going to get into, and it'll probably take two courses to do. Then we're going to talk about the ionosphere, okay, in the upper atmosphere, because that goes down up. It's like peeling an onion, right? We're kind of peeling the layers. Instead of peeling the layers of the sun, we're peeling the layers of the near-Earth system, and we're walking down to the, to, the, to the ground, slowly but surely. Okay, so regime two will be, up, upper, will be the ionosphere and upper atmosphere, and then regime three will be space weather environment on the ground. And the reason why I've broken it down that way is because you kind of need to know really from the outside in what's happening. And you'll see how space weather penetrates and how really quickly things get scrambled. Plus you need to be able to understand the Earth's magnetic shield very, I don't wanna say very well, but well. Um, and the reason for that is because it orders everything as you will very rapidly see. Um, and the nice thing about the way I'm doing it here is that in each one of these regimes, we will end up kind of rehashing some of the stuff we, we learned in the prior regime. And the reason for that is because things begin to map. As you go from the outer edge of the Earth's magnetic shield and you walk inward, you walk down to the planet, you will find that because of the Earth's magnetic field, things that happen way out here actually map, on, map down to things that you can actually detect on the ground. But it maps in a very specific way. So we'll get into that very shortly. And it's kind of neat. Okay, so any questions on that basic um, introduction. Does, is anybody lost? <laughs> Let's hope not. Is everybody, are you ready to dive in? Have I scared you away? Are you going to run for the hills? <laughs> Hopefully not. Oh, good, Adrian. Good to see you there. And Joe and, and Thinker. Who's Thinker? Cumulative knowledge. I love that. Playlist. Oh, thank you, Jerry, for putting the playlist up there too. So yes, everything is connected. Absolutely. 
And food analogies are universal. I agree. Hopefully it's not making anybody hungry. I haven't had breakfast this morning, so, so maybe it'll get to me at some point. Okay, good. Everybody's ready. Or at least multiple people. I see Julian, Vince, Mandy. Good, good. Nothing to be scared of. Science is fun. <laughs> yes, it's true. It can be. Um, I can see a few familiar names. Oh, good. I'm glad. I'm glad you guys chat with each other. <laughs> Jerry's getting hungry. Wait, I have to do this for Jerry. Yes, I have my mason jar. So I still need to get Space Weather Woman put on the mason jar and, and, and have them in, like have, have some merchandise. I still haven't done that, guys. Mm. I'm so far behind. I'm so sorry. I haven't gotten merchandise for you guys yet. I've been so many people keep asking me about it. I really need to do it. Okay. I'm too interested in teaching you than I am in, you know, getting you to wear my shirts. <laughs> okay, good. Everybody's ready. Excellent. So the overview of regime one. So let's just talk for just a second, just to kind of frame the, the whole subject. There are many different planets, as we all know, right, in our solar system. And yes, I still consider Pluto a planet. It's grandfathered in. It does not get, I'm not a Neil deGrasse Tyson fan from that perspective. I don't care. Pluto's been a planet for so long. I'm no longer, I'm not taking its, its rightful, its birthplace away. So counting all our planets, um, not, you know, they're all different. They're all extremely different. And uh, at some point we, we might even discuss um, how Venus, Earth, and Mars kind of are like this linear progression through time and uh, how Venus looks very much like what our system may have looked like many, many years, you know, millions of billions of years ago um, before we got a, a dynamo up and running, a magnetic dynamo up and running. And now the Earth, of course, is where we are now, which is a very transient part of its own history. And Mars may be where we're going because Mars has lost its dynamo. So Venus is before the dynamo formed. Earth is during the dynamo as it's, as it's doing its thing. And Mars is afterwards. And we can talk a bit about that at some point, maybe during a break, we can talk a little bit about why a lot of people believe that. Uh, it's a very compelling argument, actually. But it has to do with how the dynamo forms, uh, the magnetic dynamo forms in our iron core. But as you can imagine, as that concept e evolves and as the dynamo changes and either forms or decays, you can imagine that not every magnetic system is going to look the same, right? Earth's magnetic system is very unique to Earth, and there's not a lot of other systems that are like it, right? I mean, there's other, other planets that have their own magnetospheres. Look at Saturn, look at Jupiter, for example, but they're very, very different from ours, okay? So what I have up here is pictures of both Venus, Venus, Mars, and Earth's magnetic system. And as you can see, that when you get to, well, let me, let me explain the plots, first of all. <clears throat> What you're looking at here are cuts. You know, obviously you're not really seeing the planets themselves. What you're looking at are cuts from the North Pole to the South Pole, okay, through the middle, basically the middle of the planet. And in this case, we're just looking at density, okay? So you're not really looking at the, the density of the planet from that perspective. We're just looking at, at um, the, the way the solar wind blows from the sun, if the sun is pointed this way in Venus, the way the solar wind blows from the sun to that planet and then, of course, you've got this bow shock. It's called a bow shock because it's it's standing off the solar wind. It's just like any type of shock wave that you get when you you know throw a baseball through the solar or through the through the air, or um, an air an airplane flies faster than the speed of sound. Same kind of idea. Um, in this case, the solar wind is is moving too quick. It's it's what we call supersonic. Um, yes, there are sound waves in space, but they're not what you think they are. So. You can make a joke about it, but no, it's not the same thing as an acoustic wave. It's slightly different, but we do have sound waves in space. And, and, and solar wind can move supersonically, faster than the sound wave does in space. And when it does that, then you have to have a bow shock. You have to have some kind of shock that then diverts the flow, that's, that slows the flow down and gives it time to move around that obstacle. And anytime you have that, that's what, it, that's what the shock wave does. Okay, so that's what that outstanding that the first little kind of like boomerang looking thing is at the, the front of this um, um, front of this planet. But as you can see, there's not a lot. I mean, this is really close to the planet, right? The planet is here. The bow shock is really, really close. And then you can see a lot of that stuff right on the planet's surface. You can see a lot of that stuff being stripped away. You know what that is? <laughs> 
atmosphere, <laughs> Venus gets hit so hard and it does not have a protective magnetic shield. It's only got a, well, I can't call it a remnant shield. It doesn't have much of a magnetic shield at all, if any. And so literally that solar wind hits Venus's atmosphere and strips some of it off. Okay, we can talk about that. That's pickup ions, but um, that is a very, very different scenario than, for instance, what we have at Earth. And I'll get to that in a second. Notice the Earth, the, where that bow shock is, yes, that's a bow shock, stands much further off from the planet. The planet is clear. Here's the planet. Whoops, get my finger in the right place right there. It's this tiny little circle, right? Look how much closer the bow shock is at Venus. Look how much bigger Venus is. Whoops, over here. Look how much bigger the planet is relative to this tiny little dot where my finger is basically covering the entire planet at Earth. See how much closer? See how much further off at Earth the, the bow shock stands? It's way out here, right? And yet Venus is really, literally right at the, the, the atmosphere of the planet. Mars isn't much different. If we go to Mars, we do the same thing. We cut this way. I believe this is a Maradomo cut. And in this case, are we looking at density? Yeah, we're looking at density of the solar wind. Again, the sun coming from this direction. Right, And again, you've got that bow shock. Now it stands off a little bit further. Notice that? If I, there's a little bit more space, not much, <laughs> maybe a little bit more. So Mars is a little bit more protected. Part of the reason, and there's a little bit of an asymmetry here. So you can actually see that there's a little bit more stuff coming off the south than the north. The bow shock itself looks a little bit different. It's a little bit more intense in the north than the south in terms of density, right? That's what the, the color bar is, is indicating. So red means higher density. Um, the, the lighter colors mean lower density. And in Mars's case, there's a remnant magnetic field because Mars used to have a dynamo. And so there's the rocks on Mars, remember. And so it remembers what its dynamo used to do because the dynamo, the, the magnetic field that was the Earth's, or was the Martian shield, magnetic shield, it magnetized the rocks. And so the rocks actually remember that. And so they have their own remnant magnetism that actually extends out into space and gives Mars a little bit of protection. Not much, <laughs> which is why I worry about colonists on Mars. A lot of people talk about trying to have a spacecraft way out here to create a magnetic shield for Mars and just extend it out. And it's like, oh, really? You think you're going to have a spacecraft survive? Remember what happens at Earth when you get a geomagnetic storm? You're going to put a, a, a magnetic shield on a spacecraft? You think that spacecraft is going to be able to handle it? It's going to have its little aurora. <laughs> Do you imagine Aurora around a spacecraft? <laughs> That'd be fun. <laughs> Think it'll survive? Mm, no, nah, probably not. So, um, but that's a, that'll be a fun topic we can talk about. And you'll understand what I mean by that more after this series, because you'll totally understand why you can't have a magnetic shield be extended out by a spacecraft very easily at all, because you're inviting trouble. <laughs> because there's a lot of energy in that solar wind, and it will take advantage of a magnetic shield if you have one as we know at Earth, right? So at Mars, Mars is tough because we want to settle this planet. And yet most of the solar, the space weather that hits Mars, because there's really not much of a magnetic shield, penetrates all the way to the ground, including things like radiation storms, especially things like radiation storms. And that's bad news because what that does is it means that Mars's atmosphere goes completely opaque to sky wave propagation. Anybody who understands what that means. So over the horizon communications on Mars during a solar, during a space weather event, probably ain't happening. You can do direct, you can do ground wave. You can, if you can see the person or almost see the person, then you can probably communicate with them. But try to communicate to a satellite, try to communicate to somebody over the ground, over, over the horizon, very far over the horizon, uh-uh, ain't gonna work. So these different systems, right, make a huge difference when it comes to how space weather could affect you. And the reason for that is because every single one of these that you're looking at is a second chef. Here's Earth's second chef, and I'll talk about it in a minute. We're about to dive into this one. Here's second chef at Venus. Here's second chef at Mars, right? Very different second chefs. So the second chef really is planet dependent. Kind of cool, huh? The sun isn't, but every single time you, the sun sends us an egg, each chef is gonna crack it slightly differently and it's going to scramble it in a slightly different way. One of the neatest places is Jupiter. Boy, you should look at its second chef. Pretty, pretty impressive. As a matter of fact, Jupiter has second chef, third and fourth, fifth chefs because it's got moons that have their own magnetic fields. So you've got more pots in there scrambling, even scrambled eggs. So it's pretty crazy. Um, so at Earth, 
So here, again, we've got a, a meridional cut. So this is a cut right through the north-south pole. Here's the north pole of Earth. Here's the south pole of Earth. And if I get my finger in the right place, do, 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 do. it's always comedy, comedy, isn't it? There's second or the, the southern pole. Tickle, tickle. <laughs> sorry. Um, I'm a little, I'm in a weird mood. I'm sorry. Uh, and you can actually see kind of the outline of, of the magnetic field a little bit. You see these kind of lobes sticking out, right? If I, if I were to get my slinky, where's my slinky? There's my slinky. Hold on. Let me get my slinky. See, this is the fun bit is I get to do this here with you guys that I can't do with Millersville because it's, um, it's too, uh, it takes too much time. This way? This way? Yeah, kind of like that. Okay. If I can move my hand. There we go. Hello. Hello. Oh, hello. So if I tilt it like that. So what you're looking at, see my slinky, right? So imagine this being going all the way around the earth. And we'll see this in more in more detail here shortly. But so imagine this slinky being all the way around Earth. This is the magnetic field lines of Earth. Okay, it's kind of like a toroid, right? It goes all the way around. If I were to go all the way around, right, like that, and Earth would be in the middle of this thing. Okay, and I put it back here. Okay, now I'm gonna take that away, so you can see kind of what it looks like. See that? Do you guys see the loops? So hopefully you can see that. So that's what you're looking at when you're looking at that diagram. And it's still density, looks like. And the solar wind is still coming in from this side. But now, right, here's the sun coming in this way. But now, not only do you get something standing off much more, much more further off, right, this, this shock wave is standing off much more further off, but you get weird stuff going on. I mean, you've got a shock that's pretty thick here. Look at all the blue, right? But then you've got this extra stuff up here, which is like a foreshock happening. Anytime the solar wind does weird things and changes direction, you'll, this foreshock will move. So you can see it's kind of a double layer sometimes, not always, but it can be. And it stands off much, much further away. Okay. The reason for that is because the obstacle in the Earth's case is not just the planet, this tiny little planet that's right in the middle of this, but rather the big magnetic shield in front of it that's much, much bigger than the planet. Right. And therefore, the second chef at Earth is much, much bigger than the second chef at either Venus or Mars. Okay? So understand that from basically the bow shock, which is the cracking of the egg, you know, the, where, where the egg, if, if the sun is sending us eggs, where that egg gets cracked in a planetary system is right at that bow shock. And as soon as that that cracked egg then begins to leak all its content. And I gotta be careful how I say that because it doesn't always leak it from the front. It, 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 you'll see how, how that stuff, the content of that egg begins to leak inside the, the, you know, the different systems of the second chef. What, how, and where, how it does it and what happens to it once it starts coming inside that system is very, very different depending upon what system you're looking at. So there are people who spend, for example, their entire careers, like a lot of people at JPL and, and planetary geologists and planetary physicists who spend zero time looking at Earth. They're too busy looking at the Jovian second chef because it's way much more fascinating. It's even more complicated than ours. Or even the Saturnian one with all the rings, right? Because you have to have the rings to deal with. So um, very quickly, you, you begin to see that you have to take things very slowly and in a piece by piece fashion. Right, so this is why we're, we're going to be taking things regime by regime, okay? Because it's way too much to try to just unpack and unfold for you all at once, okay? So there are a whole discipline of people called magnetospheric physicists, okay? And it's not a magnetosphere, it's a magnetosphere. And um, um, I don't know, I don't, I, don't, I don't think I know any anybody in the discipline who actually calls it a magnetosphere. Um, so, so just so you know, um, I think the more, the more accepted term is magnetosphere and, uh, and magnetometer um, when we actually measure these things, just, just so you guys know that, because I've heard it pronounced other ways many times and, and um, 
that it doesn't get you in trouble, but it it lets people know who are in who are in the field. It lets them know that you are not in the field. So if you if you want to not have that happen, <laughs> probably call it a magnetosphere and a magnetometer, not something else. Um, so the magnetosphere is is essentially, and you probably have seen a picture somewhat like this. It's a uh, kind of like a comet. You know, the people call it a teardrop-shaped cavity, but it's also like a comet-like. And the reason why is what we're doing is, of course, we're looking at this diagram. Well, here's the sun, and the solar wind is kind of coming up toward Earth this way. And as you can see, all of that stuff in purple, that's really where you get the ordered part of the Earth's magnetosphere. Um, and then you've got this green kind of envelope around it. We call this the magnetosheath, okay? And really what the magnetosheath is, is that once you... Once you hit, hit we're, we're talking just outside or just inside the bow shock. Um, you, you can know where that bow shock is because it's it's basically defining um, where that green region begins. Okay, just inside that bow shock is what we call the magnetosheath region, and that magnetosheath region really is all about taking that solar wind, that pristine solar wind, and diverting it. Right. So what happens is that it has to slow it down because otherwise it would slam into the planet. But it we have conservation of energy, right? So you can't just slow it down without having that energy go somewhere, right? You, you've got to do something with it. Well, you got to heat it. So now the plasma, it slows, it, the solar wind slows down, it gets heated, and then, and then it's able to be diverted, <clears throat> excuse me, around this structure and down around the sides so that it can continue flowing. Whoops, I, and I really, I should have paid attention to my diagram as I did that. So, so the solar wind comes in, if it comes in straight like this, it gets right here at the front, right in the green. As soon as you pass that bow shock, it gets deflected this way and around, okay? And that's why you get, <laughs> that's why, I'm sorry, still not very good, but it's the best I could do. But that's why you get all of this region in green here is really kind of like a solar cross between a solar wind flow and in some cases, Part of the Earth's magnetic shield that's being kind of mangled uh, in this process. I don't want to say mangled, but but changed. Okay, because there's always an interaction that's going on right here in the front with this front lobe of the Earth's magnetic magnetic shield. Um, and what you're looking at here, you notice that they kind of look like thick ribbons. Sometimes you'll see the magnetic shield in lines, in terms of lines, and sometimes you'll see them in terms of ribbons. The reason why I, I chose this particular diagram is because these purple ribbons, as they're, as they're shown in this way, give you an idea that really, even though we talk about with our little slinky, we talk about little magnetic field lines, and you can even see it with the slinky, you can see that I talk about little magnetic field lines, right? If I put this little puppy, again, if I can angle it up here, try to get where Earth is kind of in the center, right? Right about like this, All right? So here's the, here's the slinky kind of sticking out. And you're seeing lines, right, in the in the with the slinky. But really, what we're talking about here are shells, okay. And so what happens is that when you when you have like the the edge of this, all these magnetic field lines together, if they all extend out to the same um, um, magnetically, the same I don't want to say the same distance. I got to be a little bit careful. The same magnetic strength, same magnetic um, in, in a sense from the from the magnetic sense of things, it is the same distance outward. Um, at a particular place, let's say the equator, the, the, the center of it. Uh, and we'll talk about this more in a second. Then you can begin to paint like a shell over it, like just kind of like, okay, these are all like contours of the same strength, field strength, same same location, same. And you create these shells. And that's what they're kind of showing here with these ribbons. See this? See, if I had, like here, they're kind of showing a shell, right here, this purple, if I can get this, this, ugh, get your hand in the right place, right there. That's kind of like a purple shell that is kind of, part of that lobe. So that would be something where I put my hand over part of the slinky and you'd have this kind of shell looking thing. Okay, like this, that would be that purple shell. See how my hand is kind of similar to that shell, right? It's got that semicircle thing happening. Same kind of idea, okay? And I want you to keep that in mind because we're gonna start diving into something called L shells very soon. And it starts with lines, right? But in the end, it ends up being a shell that goes all the way around. It's one of the most difficult concepts to grasp and one of the most difficult concepts to teach without invoking math, <laughs> as I've learned. I've taught this class, my, my SWEN 572 class twice, and 
it's tough. So we, uh, the nice thing is that over the course of this Second Chef series, we're going to be talking about L shells over and over and over again. And I'll show you movies and we'll use them in different ways. But they become extremely important um, for a concept for you to understand because of how it translates to things on the ground and how it translates to things like current systems inside this, this Earth system. Okay, so as you can see, there are a ton of little micro environments, right? You can see we've got magnetopause, magnetosheath, magnetotail, neutral sheet, plasma sheet, radiation belts, auroral zone, cusp. I mean, it becomes this massive dance. And I'll tell you, there's even more, as you'll see soon, there's even more detail than even this. So anybody who does a magnetospheric physicist can get an entire PhD based on any one of these regions and do their entire work their entire life's work in any one of these regions. It's amazing. Um, and, and each one of these regions kind of reacts to space weather in a different way and also causes effects on the ground in a different way. And these are the things we're going to continue to explore. So as you can see already, it's a complicated place, right? But it becomes this really cool ballet. And this is just region one or regime one. Remember, we have regime two and then regime three as well. So some of the things that we're going to discuss are the Van Allen radiation belts, right? We have, there's essentially two belts we'll talk about. The ring current, the plasma sphere and the plasma sheet, the magneto tail and the cusp region. So we'll be talking about these um, over the course of time and we will return to them over and over again. Here's another picture of it. I like this picture because it, now we, we don't have anything tilted and now you're looking at lines, right? Remember how I said, here's, here's the ribbons version of it right? That's kind of like cutting multiple lines kind of coalesce together in ribbons, which then become shells. So they can go all the way around. And here's a line version. Okay. Now we're cutting north, south, the solar winds coming in this way. Okay. And you see the magnetic slinky in, in terms of lines. Okay. And the lines get closer and closer into earth. It's really a dipole field essentially, especially in the heart of the earth's magnetosphere. Okay, and you can see how the solar wind begins to divert and go around. We're showing that, right? And for those of you who actually take time to read space, um, your, you know, um, journal articles and things like that, it's always nice to see these diagrams in different, presented to you in different ways, because not everybody shows them the same way when they, when they draw things out. And so when you see this kind of thing, it makes it a lot easier for you to understand if you've seen them before, right? So here, for instance, is the cusp right, coming in right in this region, and it goes all the way down and funnels all the way down whoops, to the surface of the earth. Doo -doo -doo. It's a very tiny area, and it does move, wiggles back and forth. Um, and then we have over here, we have the tail lobes. I can get my hands in the right areas. These are the big tail lobes, and you'll watch these magnetic field lines actually move. So what happens is that not only do you get stuff bouncing in and out, but you can actually take these field lines right here. And when there's a, a big um, you know, um, solar phenomenon, like CME, like, a, like a, a big solar storm hitting, you can actually break this line and peel this flux back, peel this line back and fold it over this way, both in the north and the south, and add it to the lobes. And as that happens, it squeezes that lobe down a little bit, and this new line stays on top. And then the next field line goes, breaks, and peels it back. And this process continues. And you'll see that. We'll, we'll actually so, show movies of that happening. And that's how you can actually get these big solar phenomena to really start interacting with this, with this second chef and start feeding its energy into the system. As you can see, things start at the front end, but they don't always enter this way. What happens is that you peel stuff back, and stuff actually enters from the tail. Okay. The energy, a lot of the energy distribution comes from the tail. As a matter of fact, that's how you get that tail to really elongate. And you'll hear me talk about sometimes how that tail ends up being stretched like a big boomerang or big uh, slingshot. And eventually it gets so stretched out that it breaks and shoop, shoots everything forward. And so stuff will come up the tail and actually really enter the Earth system, both in the north and in the south, from the tail. <laughs> And that's actually how you get aurora. So even though a solar storm hits Earth from the front end, 
And that's about where the energy mainly goes. The main part of that energy actually comes back up through the tail. So already, hopefully, you can see that it's a very complicated ballet, and it's not necessarily intuitive. And this is the reason why just because you know solar phenomena and you know what happens at the sun doesn't mean you know anything more than just the solar phenomena. You don't understand how it, how it works with the Earth's magnetic system. And I see a lot of people making that mistake, sadly. And this is why space weather is non-trivial, because there's a lot of people who just stare at the sun and they think they get it because they understand the phenomena there. But then there's a whole nother world once you get into this system that causes things to be very counterintuitive. And you'll see it gets even crazier than what I've just talked about. So hopefully, okay, cool, explains the slot. Oh boy. Oh, explains a lot. Okay, I thought you said the slot. No, you says explains a lot. Okay, good. Yes, the slot region is another one we'll talk about. And that's, that's uh, you'll see why that's a huge pet peeve of mine, people even using that word. Um, but that's how it has, has to do with um, space um, spacecraft orbits. But we will talk about that. That's part of what we're going to go through. Okay, let's see. If I said everything that I needed to say here. Um, yeah, I think I did. Okay, I'm wondering, does anyone have any questions thus far on this before I move on? Because this is where we start talking about L shells. So any, any, any questions? Oh gosh, I need a translator. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. Um, we have someone in here, it looks like Russian and I wish I could understand what you were saying. Um, I need a translator. I will definitely go translate that at the end of the, the course. So thank you so much for being here and I hope I hope English, I hope my accent doesn't bother you. <laughs> my American accent. Um, oh, hey, Erin. Very cool to see you here. As a meteorolo meteorologist watching this, my brain keeps thinking about the Coriolis force. Yes, and hot, how air flows on Earth. But this is fascinating and totally different. Cool. You know what? Here's the cool thing is that solar storms, these the storms that actually affect here, we've got part of the Earth's magnetic shield, which I'm going to get into in a second part of the Earth's magnetic shield actually co-rotates with the Earth. And it causes some of these forces, especially down in the plasma sphere. And there's some coupling going on between the, um, and I'm totally getting ahead of myself, but there's some coupling going on between the charged layers of the atmosphere and the neutral layers of the atmosphere, so much so that during hurricanes and things, we have actually seen incidences where, it, in, in repeatable incidences, where the lightning in some of these hurricanes and in some of these thunderstorms actually gets really intensified because if there's a big space, when there's a big space weather event happening. And it's all to do with this coupling. And it's very, very interesting because some of the current systems that we deal with actually do get affected by these, these neutral, you know, the, the, the things like the Coriolis force and stuff like that, because they're coupling together with the neutral atmosphere that really cares more about gravity and density and things like that. Whereas in the upper atmosphere where things are charged, we care about gravity, we care about density, even though density is much lower, but we also care about electromagnetic forces. So if anything, all the particles in those regions are even getting acted on by even more forces than the neutral atmosphere is. Um, so it's a very neat ballet and, and there are so few people who are actually working on trying to understand these regions and we really need it. So that's a brilliant discussion that we could have. Um, and yes, the Coriolis force matters so much, um, but we just don't have a lot of people who study that stuff yet. So thank you, Aaron, for being here. That's a National Weather Service person, official person there from, from Texas. So that's so awesome. Okay. Tickle me and I hurt you. I always, I love your name. I, I always love seeing you here. YouTube never notifies me when the doctor goes live. Oh, I'm s bad, bad YouTube, bad YouTube. <laughs> Sorry. I do put it on Facebook and on, um, on Twitter. So, so, and if you're in Patreon, you know, weeks in advance. So my Patreon folks, they knew two weeks ago that I was going to give the talk today. So even if you just follow me on Patreon, you'll know. Um, it's, it's really that simple. Let's see. Okay. So is everybody good? Um, I, wish I, could, it's, I wish I could understand you should put subtitles in Russian. <laughs> oh, that what it says? Oh, man. Yeah, I need a translator, don't I? I wish I, wish I could do that. I, I just don't have the chance to do that yet. I need... I need you know, far more people. I need to clone myself. Um, do I do I see a magnetic storm that will hit us in the what? Do I see my that will hit us in the 1800s? What do you mean? You mean 
back then, yeah, the 1859, that the, uh, are you asking, do I see another Carrington event happening? If the solar cycle is low, yes. Uh, I don't know if it's going to hit us, but we had two to almost three Carrington class events last cycle. So, you know, if we have another low activity cycle, what can I say? It's really Russian roulette at that point, right? But do I think um, the Carrington event has been overblown? Yes, I do. Um, we have a lot better way of mitigating through these events uh, than, than I think we think. Because back in the 1850s, we had no idea what the, what the heck these things were. Now we do, and, and we are planning for some of these extreme events. As a matter of fact, we actually may be better equipped to handle the extreme events like Carrington class event with the, with the grid than we are able to handle a radio burst that, that happens at the ADSB transponder um, you know, frequency of about 1,000 megahertz, 1 gigahertz. If we lose ADSB, at least just in the United States, if we lose ADSB transponders, um, and air traffic control loses loses contact with airlines over the day side of the globe like we did back in, in 2006, I think we have less capability of handling that. I mean, thank goodness we had this pandemic. God, that really sounded bad. Um, <laughs> but the pandemic has actually helped us immensely. And, and also the 2001, uh, because we, you know, we understand the global ramifications of things like that. And also the 2001 scare, uh, scare tragedy. Um, because we had to ground all the planes. Air traffic control had to ground all the planes relatively quickly. And so that gave us a, a kind of some precedent for how to get planes out of the sky quickly or to increase miles and trail for planes, which is super important um, when you're dealing with, um, you know, not being able to get messages from air traffic control to the planes and vice versa, know where your planes are. So those types of things, I think, are, are actually... Uh, a bit scarier now because I think they've not really been considered by uh, a lot of these agencies, whereas the big Carrington class events really stand out. And so we've been working on mitigating those. Um, but we still have so much, so much more to go, especially as we become so technologically um, susceptible with all the satellites going up with the ADSB transponders, you know, GPS reliant, space-based reliant um, GPS being used in almost every nook and cranny of our lives anymore. We are not ready for this. Um, space weather is, is going to bite us in the butt. It's just a question as to how much and how fast and how hard. So it was a great question though. Thank you. Um, okay, guys, looks like, looks like we're good. The ISS is in low earth orbit and protected by the mag magnetosphere from most all of the solar storms. Yes. To a great degree, yes, there are some things, and, and we will talk about a few things um, a little bit later, probably in the second part of this course, about what does reach down there, and also about Artemis, right? That has a lot of implications for Artemis, because people are going to be unprotected on the moon. Um, they don't get the, the heart of the Earth's magnetic, magnetic shield protecting them, and so that has a lot of implications. Okay, so let's dive into the hardest part of this, okay? This is a concept that don't worry if you don't get it all the way the first time. We will continue to revisit it, and we will revisit it in all sorts of different ways. So if it's a mind bender, it's okay. It's supposed to be. But the mo more we, we talk about it, the better off we'll be. So I have shown a slinky more times than I can count in this in this class. In, in solar phenomena, it's, it's, it's literally, that's why it's painted white, <laughs> is that it's just such a ubiquitous tool in this class in this in in this in space weather really um and really what we're looking at when we're looking at this behind me okay i'm talking about a dipole field and it's this isn't the best diagram because it shows all the lines converging at the poles anybody who's actually seen a real dipole field uh magnetic field um drawn you know drawn out magnetic field lines you can you know that they don't come together at a point but the reason why i like this diagram is not so much for this region but rather this which you'll see in a minute Okay, which are the lobes. So in this case, what we're looking at is I will take this cute little magnetic field and I will put it way out here and make it huge, right? And I'll send it over this way. So you're looking at this very unfocused slinky. And, and really what you're looking at is the lobes, <laughs> as it drops, the lobes of this, of this slinky out from the perspective of... Um, of the Earth's magnetic field. So I'm gonna tilt it like this, try to make it, imagine the Earth being in the middle. See my thumb kind of wiggling at you up here. My thumb is in the middle of this thing. 
that's going to be the Earth, and I'm pointing at the North Pole. So I'm going to try to line it up pretty much straight. Okay, so we're really talking about a toroid, okay, of magnetic field lines. But if I cut this slinky in half, right, then you got something like this. Okay, now what you're actually looking at are concentric slinkies. You're looking at the outer line, this, the very outer line, okay, is actually a shell that goes all the way around and connects to the outer line on the other side, okay? Now go in one, and it's, an in, it's another shell that connects all the way to the other side, to the second line, okay? And then you go in one more, and that one connects again to the inside, okay? And there's all these magnetic field lines, so it's all just like that slinky, right, with all these little magnetic field lines, and they all are connected to, you know, each shell, as we said. So think of slinkies that are kind of nested inside one another, okay? And that can kind of get your idea, your mind wrapped around the idea that they're almost like little donuts, right? Because that's what that slinky is. If I, sorry, some, I've got a, there's a comedy class going in one of my whereby rooms, so that's why you're hearing all that noise. People are entering the room. Um, so here's the donut, right? One slinky, right? But this also creates that shell around the outside, okay? But if we cut that in half and we just take a look at the outer line, the outer edges of each slinky, then what you get are, is one magnetic field line. So we've taken those shells and we've just taken them to the point where we only see one magnetic field line on each side, okay? Now, these, these magnetic field lines, believe it or not, sorry about all that noise, these magnetic field lines believe it or not, are really how everything <laughs> in their Earth space is ordered. Once you get inside the Earth's, the, the ordered part of the Earth's magnetic shield, so we're not in the magnetic sheath anymore where everything is kind of crazy and just trying to be pushed around the Earth's magnetic system, we actually get into the pristine Earth's magnetic shield. Everything becomes very ordered by this magnetic field because everything in space, all particles, everything, they're all charged, right? And what we've learned from previous mini courses is that charged particles always see electric and magnetic fields, okay? And they're governed by them. As a matter of fact, we're gonna learn something. Um, we, we've talked about it a little bit in previous mini courses. I called it frozen in flux. But we're gonna talk about it a lot more carefully in this class because it's something called, uh, um, it, there, it's part of what we call the adiabatic invariance. And the very first one, when we talked about radiation storms so long ago, we talked about magnetic field lines, kind of like these, but coming from the sun. And if you recall, particles that would go down one magnetic field line would actually gyrate around them and spin, right? And those particles were actually locked in step with that magnetic field, and that magnetic field would guide their, their motion. Um, we have the same exact thing here, okay? But obviously in this system, it's not like the Parker spiral field that comes out from the sun. This field is a lot, is, is the dipole field, okay? So what we need to start understanding is how that dipole field is shaped. And the reason for that is because what happens, let me stand here, what happens is that a particle that's right here, okay, that's jailed on this field line, right? We'll follow this field line, right? And look at, look at how, look relative to Earth, look how far out this particle is from Earth. This is like the, the maximum location, you know, the furthest away from Earth that this particle could be is right here, right? This is actually what we call the magnetic equator, right? Where you see all those arrows pointing upward, those little triangles, right? Those, that's really where the magnetic equator is. And it, as it extends out into space through, through our, whoops, I should do it this way, right? Because I'm high down to low how it extends out into space um, past Earth, okay? Now, this field line, if there's a particle right here, it's the furthest away from Earth at the magnetic equator, and then it continues, it gyrates all the way around this, part, this field line, and it stays stuck around this field line, okay? This is what we call it, this is what we call an adiabatic invariant. It's the same kind of thing that we saw with radiation storms. But look at the particle now. Is it as far away from Earth as it was? Nope, not even at, it's not at the same latitude. It's not at the same, probably, at, well, it won't be at the same longitude and you'll find out why soon. But 
let's continue. As it continues going, it can actually go, whoops, I jumped off the field line. It can actually go all the way down into the Earth's upper atmosphere, right? If it's got, in this case, the right amount of energy. But notice it's still stuck on the same field line. So a field line, okay, a magnetic field line from Earth, you know, from Earth's magnetic shield can actually guide particles in and around certain areas in space, right? So the particles, if they're jailed by this magnetic field, which they are, they can't just willy-nilly go anywhere they want. Not at all. They have to be guided by the field to stay in certain locations, guided by that field. And therefore, when you're a scientist and you're trying to understand how things work, how space weather works, remember, charged particles create currents. Currents are very important. Currents then can turn around and affect the strength of magnet magnetic fields. So it's just like this complicated ballet that goes back and forth and back and forth. If you can understand how charged particles move in this field, then you can understand how current systems work, and you can understand how this magnetic shield gets modified by those currents, okay? Because it changes, it goes up and down, depending upon where you are. It also wiggles and does all sorts of stuff, but a lot of that has to do with what the particles are doing, okay? So the first bit to understand is to understand that the magnetic field jails these particles and understand that by jailing these particles, it forces these particles to travel in very, very, very specific paths, okay? Now we'll talk more about those paths in a minute, but the first part to understand and the most important part to understand is that there is an order to this magnetic field and we actually have names for it. We call them L shells. And why do we do that? Well, if you go to the magnetic equator, Okay, right where essentially, it's just like the geographic equator on Earth, except it's by the magnetic field. Okay, we've talked a little bit about equators. We, we talked about solar, the, the magnetic equator on the sun, same kind of idea, right? And just like the magnetic equator on the sun, that, that magnetic equator is tilted. The, mag, the magnetic field of the, of the Earth is tilted just like the magnetic field of the sun is tilted with respect to its geographic equator. Right, we've talked about that in many courses, many of the many courses. <laughs> That's funny, many, many, right. Um, we've talked about that in probably, I don't know, four or five different courses, it's been brought up many times. So same kind of concept here. We have that equator, and in this case, it's a magnetic equator, and it extends out into space, okay? Well, if we pull out these field lines, when we look at these field lines along this equator, we see that in the heart of the Earth's magnetic system, okay, where it looks very much like a dipole field, we have this very well-ordered system and in, in which the magnetic field lines extend as far out from Earth as they can, as they do, you know, the furthest point right at the magnetic equator. And then as they begin to converge back in to the Earth's magnetics, you know, into the Earth's upper atmosphere, the magnetic field lines, not only do they get closer together, let me, let me go on this side. So here they're really far apart, right? The space between the two is big, but you notice as they converge into the Earth's upper atmosphere, they get closer and closer together. See that? See how close they get? That's another reason why I like this diagram, even though it gets a little unrealistic up here, because they never really touch these magnetic field lines get really, really close together. In electric electricity and magnetism, and this is why it's hard to talk about this without math, in electricity and magnetism, even in a diagram, as field lines get closer together, that means the field strength goes up. The field gets stronger. So you can see, even in this diagram, the field is the weakest out here, where the field lines are far apart. But over here, near the poles, the, fields get, the field gets stronger. Okay, because all these field lines are converging. They're all kind of diving in to what we call the foot points of the Earth's magnetic field in here, which is actually, of course, driven by the dynamo, which is the core, right? So they go all the way through the planet. Okay, but they get really, but all of these field lines out here really have to all pack themselves into the core of this planet, right? So they have to get whoo, squeezed together. And that's why the field is so strong, right? But of course, it, obviously, this is where the magnet is, right? And the field lines come out. So you get the influence of the magnet out here, but it's much weaker than it would be here, 
And that's what the diagram is also showing by showing these field lines being further and further apart. Okay. But all this is, all of this is very, is still very ordered. There's still a very ordered aspect of it. And so what we do, what we realize is that with these shells, even if you have a particle here, okay, it's, it's seeing a weak magnetic field. And yet if it were over here, that same particle would see a strong magnetic field. And that particle, so that particle then would, you'd, you'd think if you were to just kind of order things according to like, let's say geography, right? Just geographic X, Y, Z coordinates. Well, now this particle used to be on a weak, it used to be in weak magnetic field. Now it's in strong magnetic field. It used to be far away from the planet. Now it's close to the planet. Boy, this two, these two regimes are completely unrelated. Wrong. They're very related because they're on the same magnetic field line. So we have to order things, not according to space, geographic space, not according to magnetic field strength, but according to what line are you on? What line of flux, what magnetic field line are you on? And if we define it as from the equator, the magnetic equator, where the field lines get as far away from the planet as possible, and we call, we call them L shells, okay? And I'm not gonna get into the details as why they're called L shells, but I can even give you a mathematical formula if you're interested. Um, and we can talk about it in a sidebar if I, if I need to, especially with people on Patreon. But you'll notice that if I say L1, this is the first L shell, L2, L3, L4, L5, L6. Now, no matter what happens, if I label them one, two, three, four, five, six, and they're at the equator, no matter what happens, if I squeeze them in, push them and make them tighter, because I'm pushing on them like a, a, a spring does, you know, you can, springs are springy, so this can spring in and out, okay? But those field lines are never going to touch each other. They don't. That's just the rules. <laughs> Ask Maxwell. Don't blame me. Just blame Maxwell. The magnetic field lines don't touch each other necessarily, and they can't cross. So you can make them closer together, which actually strengthens the field and makes them, you know, come closer to Earth, but you'll still have one, two, three, four, five, six. And they will still thread exactly the same way they did before. And so now, now you have a system that can breathe, it can wiggle, it can shake, and you can have particles being jailed, moving up and around these regions. And if you say, no, this particle's on L, an L shell of six, then you know where that particle is almost at all times. You know what part of the magnetosphere, what part of that magnetic shield you're talking about, right? So for example, here is L of six, right? We talked about L of six, right? And it happens, and remember, these shells go all the way around the planet, right? So L of six here is the same as L of six over here, right? Which is the same as L of six that would be out here in front of you, and the same as L of six behind us, behind Earth on the other side, okay? Because it goes all the way around. L of five would be nested inside, L of four nested inside that, L of three nested inside, da, 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 all the way down to L of one. What is, what is the one, two, three, four, five, six? The numbers come from how many radii away. So L of one is one Earth radius away from Earth. L of two is two Earth radii away from Earth. What is that? 6,371 kilometers, right? L of three is now three times that. L of four is now four times that. L of five is now five times that as measured at the equator, the magnetic equator. Because think about it, <laughs> all of these L shells converge up here. L of six is still L of six, but it's not six Earth radii away from the Earth here. It's in the Earth's atmosphere, right? So L of six from that perspective doesn't make any sense. Ah, oh, but yes, it does. Because at the equator, that's where it's defined. And now it's talking about all the particles that are jailed along that, all the particle distributions and everything else. Something else we talk about in L shell, at least in terms of um, Earth's, you know, magnetospheric physicists, is let's say geosynchronous orbit. People who know geosynchronous orbit very well know that it's at L of 6.6. .6. So we talk about that. And the reason why we say that, the reason why we talk about it in that way is because we say, hey, the outer radiation belt of the Earth, now everybody knows the radiation belts are bad, right? And they affect satellites. Well, the outer radiation belt, what we call the outer zone, is anywhere between L of 4 and about L of 6, okay? And it spreads out, even the hairy edge of it spreads out past geosynchronous. 
So geosynchronous satellites sit in the outer edge of the outer zone of the Earth's radiation belts. But when I say now, Earth's radiation belts are anywhere, or the outer zone is anywhere between L4 and L6, you have an idea suddenly what donut that ring, that where that is in this diagram. Am I right? Because when I say that, you can imagine now, one, two, three, four, five, six, <laughs> that you have a radiation zone, a hot spot for satellites that are sitting anywhere out here. And we'll talk about that. Hopefully that makes sense. Does that make sense to people? Is this completely... Yeah, human resonances are down in the neutral atmosphere. That's a totally different topic. We are way further out than that, right? Six Earth radii out. So 35,000 kilometers. How does a particle get to one or the other inner, inner L shells? Ah, we will talk about that. Yes, we will. Um, and it does happen. I oftentimes call it jailbreak. It's uh, break, it literally breaking what we call one of the adiabatic invariants. There are three of them, and we will talk about them. But in order to talk about them, I need to make sure you guys know this, you understand this concept. Is this making sense? It doesn't have to make sense like super great yet, because we will do demonstration after demonstration, and we will talk about how the implications of understanding the system. But hopefully nobody is like completely lost. Um, I could go for a donut. Good, good, good. Yeah, good. It sounds like, is that why they say Lagrange points at L1, et cetera. No. Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up. Yes, I've been asked that question before. No, the Lagrangian points are different. So if you have an L1 point, we have an L2, an L3, an L4, L5. Radically different. L shells are completely unrelated. Um, a Lagrangian point is a point at which the gravity between the sun and the earth or the gravity between different celestial bodies is somewhat balanced. And so it allows a, if you were to put a spacecraft in that regime or in that, in that area, um, you, it, it allows less energy to be used um, in fuel because that it's a stable point. And so what happens is that for Lagrangian points, what we usually do, like the L1 point, which is just ahead of, of the Earth's bow shock uh, out in the solar wind, that Lagrangian point, we have, we use it as like a, a, a focus, like a, like a, almost like a gravity center. And we have orbits, we have, we have multiple spacecraft orbiting that, that Lagrangian point, because it's a stability point for it. And so it takes a lot less fuel to, to hold a spacecraft at, you know, when it orbits a Lagrangian point, than it would if it were floating somewhere else in space, we'd have to do a lot more orbit maneuvers and burn our fuel much more quickly. Um, L3, for example, no, excuse me, L2, for example, is the same point, but just behind the Earth, so in shadow. So James Webb Telescope, for example, I believe is at L2. Um, and then the L3, uh, L4, and L5 points, is that right? Is it, I'm trying to remember, L3 is directly behind Earth, isn't, L5 is sideways as quadrature of, of, of the Sun, excuse me, um, and then L4, is that, is that L4 and 5? So L3, 4, and 5 are around the sun. And then, yeah, I think it's just L1 and L2. I hope I didn't get that wrong. Um, L1 is definitely the one in front of Earth. L2 is the one just directly behind Earth. And then L3 is behind the sun, opposite of Earth. L4 is to the west of, of the sun from Earth's perspective. And L5 is to the east of the sun from our perspective. We are planning on getting a spacecraft at L5 very soon. So um, ESA is working on that now. I would love to have a spacecraft at L3, which is means directly behind the sun, but um, I don't. We, that's that's a that's a challenge because we'll probably have to have a relay station in order to do that. Um, for a to that's a topic for a totally different class. But yes, those are totally different L's um, points, the so Lagrangian points, totally different than L shells here at Earth. Okay. Uh, so don't get that confused, but that is a very good, that's a very good question that you asked. So thank you. Um, Tamitha always makes me think that she's drinking moonshine out of that, <laughs> that jar. Yeah, well, <laughs> no, that's after class. <laughs> no, I, I try to stay frosty for this. It's just ice water. Um, so, okay, got it. Good, 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 good. Um, 
Have you covered what our astronauts are going to face? Dangers, proton events, magnetic storms? Uh, I haven't covered that yet, but I will. And some of that I'll be covering in, in multiple different classes. Remember, these classes um, have different parts. So, okay. So, hopefully you understand now a little bit about L shells and why we will continue to talk about them as time goes on. Also, what I want you to know is that L shells don't just stop at six. They are L7, 8, 9, 10 is out to infinity if you want until up until the point you get to where the edge of the Earth's magnetic system is. Because at some point, right, we get to that magnetosheath region. We call that the magnetopause. That's the boundary between the ordered magnetic field of the Earth's system and that part where the solar wind is really trying to rip it apart. It's trying to shred it. And that's the magnetosheath region. And so the magnetopause is the edge of the ordered system of the Earth's of the Earth's magnetic system. Just like the heliopause, when we talked about the sun's magnetic system, the heliopause was the edge of the ordered part of the sun's magnetic system, right? So we use in these terms over and over again um, because they mean the same thing. It's just we're now looking at a different planetary body or a different celestial body, right? In this case, we're looking at Earth, a much smaller system than the sun, which had its own heliosphere and its own heliopause and heliosheath and its own termination shock and bow shock and all that other stuff too. So, um, so think of the Earth's magnetic system, especially when you get into what we call the heart of the Earth's magnetic system, which is around L of six or seven, you know, around in there. Um, it, this, it's very much shaped like a dipole field. It very much looks like this, and it very much stays like this. Now, it can be compressed and spring and, and move, you know, shake, rattle, and roll a little bit, but the heart of the Earth's magnetic shield stays pretty coherent, okay? We can't necessarily say that for what we call high L shells, which are way out in the solar wind, because they're the ones being shredded by the solar wind. And so there's a lot of activity that goes on there and a lot of reconfiguration. And we'll see why that's important very, very soon. So, and as a matter of fact, we'll start it now. <laughs> so the why I teach you about L shells, and I guess I'll stand on the side again. And hopefully, see, this is why I keep, I'll show you these diagrams over and over and over again, is that you're seeing here, here's again another picture of, of the Earth. You're seeing its rotation axis, you know, kind of tilted relative to the magnetic equator. The magnetic equator is now, as you can tell by these, these, um, these, you know, butterfly wings, right? These big, these big magnetic field um, loops coming out. The magnetic equator is pretty flat in this case, right? And so we've tilted the rotation axis of the Earth um, to show that the geographic equator is not aligned with the Earth's magnetic equator. And again, we've got L shells, right? L of 1.5, if I get my hand in the right place, L of 2, 3, 4, 5 in this case, right? And again, you can see where the magnetic equator stretches out to because that's where the furthest point away from the, um, from the Earth, right? Where the field lines go out the furthest before they begin to come back in again. But here's the neat thing. And this is why L shells are so unbelievably important to us on the ground. As you saw, they come into the planet, right? L of five comes all the way in, L of four comes all the way in. Notice, however, when they come in, look, look at L5. See it coming into the South Pole over here? Get my hand in the right place. It comes in really high latitude in the south and in the north, right? In the north, if I come down here, really, really high latitude, right? But what if I go in a shell? If I go to L of four, it comes at slightly lower latitudes. Oops, let me get my hand in the right place this way, I guess. I'm not used to the mirrored effect here. There we go. So it's slightly lower latitudes. And if I go to L of three, slightly lower latitudes on both sides. And if I get my hand out of the way, L of two, right? Slightly lower latitudes. Do you see how it's going down to lower, lower latitudes on the Earth as you get into lower, lower L shells? So high L shells map to high latitudes. Lower L shells, so go to L of two, map to lower latitudes. As a matter of fact, if we go to a map of Earth, we can actually see that. Now, again, just like on the sun, right? These are lines of latitude, magnetic latitude to a great degree. But that's not the same as the geographic equator, right? The Earth's magnetic equator tilts. And that's why you see these lines are not straight. 
is because they're tilted relative to the geographic equator, and so it dips. Just like at the sun, we saw that magnetic equator on the sun also was wiggly for much, very much the same reason, especially at solar minimum. So what you want to look at is here, L of 5, L of 4, L of 3, L of 2, L of 1 and a half. Do you see how, how they map? You start out with high L shells up here, and you go to low L shells down here. Okay, And this is, again, all using these magnetic field lines as they, di as they converge into the Earth's atmosphere. You start getting an understanding that depending upon where you are on the globe, you will be able to know what's happening at different parts in the magnetosphere. So if I'm up, if I'm up in, in you know, Alaska, for example, I'm at L of 5. I can sit here in L of 5. And if something out here in the Earth's magnetic system, whoop, sorry, right here in the Earth's magnetic system, wiggles, shakes, rattles, and rolls, it propagates all that information all the way down the L shells, whoop, all the way down L of 5 L shell, da, 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 into the upper atmosphere and down onto the, the planet. And I'm sitting over here in Alaska and I'm going, whoa, why is my magnetometer wiggling? There must be something going on over at L5. Isn't that interesting? Does everybody kind of understand that idea? So the, so the high L shells that's happening way out here in the Earth's magnetic system map to high latitudes. Low L shells map to lower latitudes. And where that becomes intriguing is not just that you can imagine being at super high L shells, being super high latitudes, you now kind of know if something's rocking and rolling at an L shell out in the Earth's magnetic system. But if you get to high enough L shells, you can get to the edge of the Earth's magnetic system. And so you can tell if the solar wind is mucking with Earth's magnetic shield. And of course, the first you know, just like peeling an onion. If you want to peel an onion or bite into an apple, you're going to bite from the outside in, right? It works from the outside in. So you're going to work from high L shells inward. So what kind of what kind of expectations would you see on the ground? You'd probably expect to see something happening at higher latitudes, reflecting what's going on in the Earth's magnetic system. You'd expect to see it at higher latitudes before you'd expect to see it at lower latitudes. Why? Because higher L latitudes map to higher L shells. Does that make sense? See how useful L shells are? Whoa, did I just blow your mind? Oh my God, we can stand on the ground and know what's happening in space? Like really? Like, whoa, isn't that cool? This is what magnetospheric physicists do their entire lives, right? Some of them do nothing but work on ground magnetometers. The USGS, for example, has tons of them. We've got tons of them in, in Canada. We've got tons of them in, in Sweden. We've got tons of them all over the planet. And people just sit there and watch these little magnetic field lines wiggle. And they're not just looking at stuff that's going on the ground. No, they're mapping it back to here. <laughs> they're learning about our magnetic system and what our magnetic shield is up to. Yep, I got it. Wow. <laughs> cool. Yes, it's how the aurora spreads too. Yes, very smart knowing. You can start people who have an idea of how this stuff works and you wonder why is aurora always in northern latitudes, but then when we have a big storm, it drops way south. Well, what do you think's happening, right? Something starts when you have a weak magnetic storm, it's just mucking with the outer layers. But when you got a strong one, chomp, 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 it just chomps down the flux all the way down to really low latitudes. It peels all sorts of stuff back, right? And we'll see examples of that. And that's why you see the aurora starting at high latitudes. And then when the storm gets stronger, goes dunk, 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 <laughs> and kind of just works its way down, right? Well, oftentimes we we call the auroral oval or the polar cap. And I always make a joke about it being like, I need to get a, um, one of my students had an actual cap, like a ski cap, right? And we used to tease, I used to make him pull it down over his head, right? So he'd be wearing the little cap. And then when the storm got bigger, he'd have to pull it down over his eyes and pull it lower and lower and lower. And pretty soon we had him completely down where he had the cap completely covering his face. And you have, if you think of this being a globe, I know it's, try, it's, <laughs> I'm a little misshapen earth, but you know, 
so here's the northern, here's the North Pole and the South Pole with my chin. So we put a cap on the North Pole and you have a cap, a similar cap on the South Pole. And as you pull the cap down in the North, you're pulling up the cap in the South because right, they're symmetric, right? Because the L shells both attach at the South and at the North. So you have two caps. You have a cap on the North and the South and whatever's happening at high L shell, you know, at, at in the North is gonna happen at the same high L shell in the South. But then if you peel it back and you get stuff happening at L of two and three, for example, well, you're pulling that cap down in the north. You're pulling that cap down quite a bit, but you're also pulling the cap from the south up quite a bit. So you pull down and pull up. And you can imagine eventually, if this is the brim of the cap in the north and the brim of the cap in the south, eventually, if you've got a big enough storm, those two caps are going to meet right in the middle. <laughs> and that my friends, is a Carrington event. The entire Earth is engulfed. Okay? Sound interesting? And that would be Aurora from that point. We're talking about Aurora. Okay. I guess that's also why sometimes we don't have anything anymore up here at high latitudes. Yes, that is why if you're at high latitudes and there is a very big magnetic storm, you're no, if you're in the northern hemisphere, you're no longer looking northward for the Aurora. The Aurora goes right over you, and now you have to look south because that auroral cap just went, here's it in the north for you, if you're at L of five, and the magnetic storm gets bigger, 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 now the aurora is right overhead, and then it can get bigger, 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 and now the aurora is south of you. Get it? You're watching that auroral oval, you're watching basically the Earth's magnetic shield getting rattled in such a way that it's peeling the flux back, we call it flux, peeling it back L shell by L shell by L shell, and then slowly recovering, okay? High L shell, down to low L shell, and then recovering. High L shell, low L shell, and then recovering again. That's why the aurora goes further south and comes back up. Is L1 disturbed if aurora? Which L1? When you have a capital L1, see, I have to ask, is that the Lagrangian point ahead of Earth, meaning the solar wind? No, if it's L1 down here, uh, that would be a Carrington class event. <laughs> and I'll show you movies. I don't know if I'll get to them today. I, I, I'll probably show a couple of movies today just, just, just for poops and grins. Um, and I'll show them again um, before we leave. But yes, uh, only really, really big events cause that because, as we said, the heart of the Earth's magnetic system, really it takes a massive event to peel the layers clear down here. Now, the near-Earth you know, when we talk about the Earth's magnetic tail, we can be talking about 30 Earth radii down tail. So that would essentially, if, if the Earth, if the magnetic shield were dipolar completely, you know, look like a dipole field all the way out, then it would be L of 30. Now, that's not really what happens because if we look at the tail of the Earth, it gets pulled, right? Here's the heart where it looks very much like a dipole field in this region, right? You can see those pretty dipole field lines, right? The pretty lobes. But look what happens when it goes further out. And this isn't a great diagram of that, but you can see those magnetic field lines being pulled. And that's what I'm talking about in a slingshot. This is a nice example of how you get a magnetic field line that's stretched out and becomes a, like more like a slingshot. But the, the field line is, a, it doesn't really bend quite like this. This is, this is pretty intense. If it's bending like this, that means something's happening right now. A lot of energy being, being you know, um, pushed off that way, or I mean, being released that way at that time. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about movies. I'll show, show you movies in that regard. So I'm trying to think, is there's anything I needed to show? No, not yet. I think hopefully you guys, this, this begins to, to start putting some pieces together for you. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything that I, I want to say. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll say one other thing before we leave this. Notice, and I'll stand on this side. Notice with where these magnetic field lines die down, right? They dip down over where the United States is. See this? So if you live in the Western Hemisphere, you're lucky. At least right now you are. The reason why is because an L shell of five, for example, dips much deeper down over the United States than it does, let's say, over Siberia and Russia and, you know, the UK, right? 
And the reason for that, in terms of, in terms of geographic latitude, and the reason for that is, again, because we have that magnetic field tilting relative to the geographic magnetic field. This is why Aurora reaches the United States much, much easier with weaker storms than it does people in this hemisphere, okay, even in Europe. Because you have people at the same geographic latitude are at lower L shells in Europe than they are in the United States. Okay. Now, granted, the pole is moving, right? And that's changing. We're moving a little bit more towards Siberia now. And so that's going to change the shape of these field lines, I mean, these, these mappings, and it does. But um, check, OK. Just making sure I have, a, I, I heard something. So I'm just making sure I have, I had microphone still working. Um, but the, uh, um, but you know, overall, we're still pretty much like this. We're still dealing with the United States having a much better um, viewing range for Aurora than, um, and, and also, you know, inclement geomagnetic effects um, than other places. Uh, same thing with Tasmania and Australia. You wonder why you get so much in New Zealand. You wonder why you get so much Aurora there as opposed to, let's say, South Africa. Same reason. Because the auroral oval, the L-shells, actually come up to lower latitudes because of the tilt. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Um, am I wrong or feel grows when there is more solar flux as it feeds off solar flux, so to speak? Uh, no, um, not, the, not the solar flux. Now, you have to be careful because there's lots of different types of solar flux. If you're talking about solar magnetic flux, then you're talking the magnetic field of the solar wind. And yes, that's mainly how the, our Earth's magnetic shield you know, interacts with because it interacts with the magnetic field of, of the solar wind. But if you're talking solar flux like EUV, like, like total solar irradiance, that kind of flux, um, no, um, because that's, that's electro, it's um, you know, massless um, and it's not, it's not really magnetic. It, it affects the Earth's upper atmosphere, sure, but that's slightly different. Um, and also, in, again, the, the, the radio flux as well, that's just electromagnetic energy, but in the form of light. So it's different. It doesn't really affect the Earth's magnetic field. Um, it can affect to, to the ionization of the upper atmosphere, which has a small effect on the Earth's magnetic field in terms of driving currents, but it's pretty mild. Uh, and most of those effects are um, most of those effects are basically much more um, periodic because yes, we do have fluctuations in the in the sun's uh, solar flux, of course, with solar cycle, also diurnal variations, because obviously the night side of the Earth is not getting any solar flux compared to the day side. So we have those types of variations. But when there is a solar flare, you get a transient effect, uh, especially with X-rays with the Earth's upper ion, you know, Earth's ionosphere, the D region, for example. But the effects are so transient that they don't really affect the Earth's magnetic shield nearly so much. We see those impacts in the ionosphere, and they're very local, but we don't necessarily see them as a huge thing for um, affecting the Earth's magnetic shield. And, I'll, and, and you'll see why, because there's main, you know, I'll, I'll begin, and I'm going to start talking about them right now, as a matter of fact, um, because there are current systems that are, that are so much more weighty, um, that, that really contain the energy, the main energy and the main mass of the Earth's magnetic system, that those little transient effects, like a mosquito, right? bite. It's, it's, it really doesn't affect all that much. Hopefully that answers some things. Okay. We're coming up on, let's see, an hour and 45 minutes. So this, by the way, is a good pause for those of you, and I'm just going to, going to sit here for a break for just a second. And this is a good pause for those of you who um, might want to say, okay, She's, plugged, she's filled my head with craziness. I am going to back off um, and, um, and, and catch up later. So, so feel free uh, if you want to take a big breather. Because uh, I'm, what I'm going to get into next is the Earth's magnetic shield. Um, I mean, some of the current systems in the Earth's magnetic shield, only as an overview to give you an idea of how, um, how energy, to, to some degree, how energy is stored 
in our system. And I'm not going to go into it super in depth yet, because we will we will revisit that information later on. But I'm going to talk about some of the particle populations. I'm trying to think when I want to show movies. That's my problem. Okay, I've got 30 slides here. Sorry, guys, I'm not used to teaching it in, in this way. I gotta figure out where do I wanna break? I'll show you, let me just, I'll, you know what, I'll do it after this slide. Cause I think that'll be good before I get into current systems. So some of the regions, the main regions I wanna talk about inside the Earth's magnetic shield. Um, I wanna talk about these regions a little bit because a, they're super important for either space weather effects, or B, they're super important when it comes to uh, coupling to the Earth's upper atmosphere, or C, they're super important because they carry the energy, or all, or, or um, they they carry a lot of the the yeah the energy in the current system, the current in in the uh, Earth's magnetic system, and they're very important for the dynamics of the Earth's magnetic system as a whole. But as we talked about. We talked about the, the L-shells jailing different particles and jailing different particle populations, and it does. The interesting thing, though, is that each particle population, as I talk about here, the ring current, the plasma sphere, and the, vent, and the radiation belts, these re it's not that these regions are jailed by themselves, okay? These jail cells, <laughs> if we're gonna call them that, are, um, um, are shared, okay? These particle populations actually do overlap each other. And we're gonna order them, of course, according to L-shell, and that's super important because, again, that dictates where everything is. And I think I'll probably get into, I think I'll probably get into, hang on one more second. I'm trying to see if I'm gonna get into adiabatic invariance today. I don't know if I will. I don't know if I will. Um, so that's a lot of information. So I'm just trying not to overwhelm you guys too much. But here we go. Okay. So the some of the different things that we have to think about when we talk about particle populations in the Earth system is obviously energy, right? The main and and then of course species. Obviously, the main particles that we have are gonna be protons and electrons, okay? Um, electrons are the ones that basically car carry most of the current. The reason for that is because electrons move very quickly. Um, I think I've mentioned to you in previous uh, mini courses where we were talking about, for instance, um, I think radiation storms. We were talking about, it's the difference between a semi-truck and a motorcycle, right? If you're driving on the highway and you're both starting, well, you're, you're at a stoplight, you both gun it right? You've got a semi-truck racing motorcycle. I mean, it's laughable, right? We know the motorcycle is going to get off the line faster. And even if the top speed, both, both particles, you know, both the semi-truck and the motorcycle reach the same top speed, the, the motorcycle is clearly going to win. And the reason why is because it got off the line faster. It was able to accelerate to its top speed much more readily than the semi-truck because the semi-truck is like in granny gear trying to, you know, get itself going. Well, that's the same kind of idea as what is behind electrons being the motorcycle, really teeny tiny particles that have very little mass and therefore very little inertia, and so they can move fast. Whereas you have these big protons or you have even heavier um, um, atoms like you know oxygen, uh, for example, like you see sometimes in the plasma sphere. Um, these are very, very heavy, right? Very, very dense particles that then even if they're charged and see the electric and magnetic fields that make them move, um, that, that are the accelerators, those bigger, heavier ions are going to take more time to get up to their top speed. So really, because of that, the motorcycles, meaning the electrons, have them, to have them beat hands down. And so um, just keep that in mind, that electrons, when, when we talk about current systems, Really, it's the electrons that cause those that, that are the bulk of the current, um, despite the fact that they're not the bulkiest player, right? They're not the semi-truck. Um, and, and I have to be also very careful because the convention, sadly, the convention for current systems is positive charge is the direction of the current. <laughs> 
but it's the electrons we care about. Yes, but it's the positive charge, not the elect negative charge that shows the direction of the arrow. So, you know, don't you love physicists? They, as if they couldn't make things more complicated, they do. Um, even though in the Earth's magnetic system, the electrons carry the current, the current direction will always be the opposite of the direction that electrons are moving. <laughs> oh, lovely, that's just great. Char sign conventions. Um, you ever wonder why people don't become physicists? That's, that's probably one of the reasons. Uh, okay, so when we talk about these populations, we've got, for instance, the ring current. The ring current is actually, if I, if I look at Earth here, okay, and you can already see, if we're kind of looking down at Earth in an oblique sense, right, we're kind of, here's the North Pole over here, right up at the top here. We've got the North Pole here, the South Pole obviously is underneath kind of there, but we're kind of looking down at obliquely, and we're looking basically at a torus, right? Remember our wonderful Slinky, right? You wonder why I keep bringing it up. <laughs> It's just a wonderful thing. You imagine the particles being in this slinky, right? Kind of like jailed, almost like in CERN. If this was a little mini version of the particle accelerator of CERN, that's exactly what we're talking about. Who knew that Earth's magnetic system was actually the perfect particle accelerator? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you imagine? So when it gets energized, it's kind of like CERN cranking up the magnetic field and suddenly you're accelerating particles to find the Higgs boson, right? <laughs> um, same kind of idea. And so when we have these big geomagnetic storms that hit, these big solar storms that hit Earth and they cause, they inject more particles into the Earth system and they crush the Earth's magnetic system to make the field stronger, suddenly you've like turned on this particle accelerator to a higher level, right? They turned it up to 11. And now all these particles in here that may or may not be energetic at the time suddenly get accelerated and become more and more and more energetic. The more they go around this little accelerator, the bigger kick they get, the more energetic they become. That's another part of that ballet, right? But it's all based on L-shell, guys. Once again, all based on L-shell. So you can see, for example, it's kind of hard to see where the ring current is, but if you look for the blue, you can see the blue. And it's located, essentially, at the edge of this green, which is the outer, outer zone of the, the outer radiation belt, which we'll talk about in a second, all the way down to about the inner part of where the purple, well then, you know, kind of about where the purple is, okay? To the end where the inner of that green is, okay? So this ring current is sitting, and we'll talk about this in a bit more. The ring current has, it, it basically is co-located with where the radiation belts are, if you want to talk about it that way. And it's sitting just on kind of like the outer edge of the plasma sphere. So the plasma sphere can go all the way out depending upon what kind of how busy um, the Earth's magnetic system is. But that ring current is low energy stuff, okay? Low energy electrons, low energy protons, low energy some other uh, heavier ions, but not a lot of them, mainly protons and electrons. And it's the low energy stuff, but it's very, very dense. So it's the most dense of the regions. And as it swirls around, around and around and around in this particle accelerator, you can imagine it's swirling around it's moving and it's charged. Well, what are moving electrons, let's say, in, in an environment? Well, that's a current, right? And that's why we call it a ring current. It's because it keeps, these particles keep moving around and around and around in this ring, okay? So the main energy, this main energy, um, or this main, this main current is really where most of the energy of the, the Earth's magnetic system resides. These particles don't change very easily. They don't like changing where they're going. They're ha very happy where they are. They accelerate a little bit. They decelerate a little bit. They, the current gets stronger. The current gets weaker. But because there's so many particles and it's such a wide range from essentially L of like uh, 2 all the way out to L of 5, this is a very large region. Okay? And to change those, that current takes a lot of energy. And remember, when you have an electric current, you have electric fields. Those electric fields generate magnetic fields. Those magnetic fields then affect Earth's magnetic field too. So it's kind of like an energy storage system where some of that energy is put into the ring current, some of it can be taken out and put into magnetic field, and it's kind of this handshake exchange. And so when we get geomagnetic storms, that ring current gets altered. Some of the energy of the Earth's magnetic system goes into that ring current to intensify the current. That ring current, that intensification of that ring current then 
actually reduces the magnetic field strength of the Earth's magnetic system. So it's kind of how we get rid of some of this excess energy. Okay. Plasmosphere. The plasmosphere is very, very close to the Earth. As a matter of fact, it goes all the way to the Earth's upper atmosphere. In fact, there's a lot of oxygen, not a lot, but some oxygen ions. They're charged. Remember, once you get out in space, everything's charged. So not, not any neutrals. But this plasmosphere goes out not quite as far as the ring current, but it's co-located to some degree. And when there is some crazy geomagnetic storm stuff going on, crazy other stuff going on, these particles can actually, you can actually create this plume that actually reaches all the way out to the front of the Earth's magnetic system. We call it a, a, a um, literally a plume, <laughs> a plasma plasmosphere plume, I think is what we call it. And, and you actually can actually get particles to be ejected out of the Earth's magnetic system. We see that happen from time to time. It's pretty cool. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, this is the most dense region, but it doesn't carry as much energy. Okay, And it's also, like I said, connected with the Earth's upper atmosphere. And this is something that you pay attention to if you're a terrestrial weather person, because part of this plasmosphere actually co-rotates with the Earth and aligns itself with what's going on um, with the, the upper ionosphere and down into the neutral atmosphere. So it kind of couples. This is an interesting regime in space weather if you are a terrestrial weather physicist and you want to kind of know how, how space weather and, and terrestrial weather are coupled, you'd want to be paying attention to the plasmosphere. And then, of course, the most famous of all are the Van Allen radiation belts. And yes, there are two of them. Okay, there's an inner zone and an outer zone. And yes, the in-between is called the slot is it empty? No. Why? Because you have the ring current. <laughs> it's not empty, and so those particles can always be accelerated to become more energetic. And oftentimes, there, there's a lot of movement going on, and we'll see that very shortly. This region, just because it gets swept a little bit with some, you know, of Earth's magnetic, or Earth's uh, um, radio broadcasts, gets swept out a little bit, and the particles get kicked out of those of that area to some degree doesn't mean the slot really exists. And if it does exist, it gets cleaned out a little bit, but it's very minor. It's not, not nearly as empty as you might think it would be. And of course it gets filled back in every time we have a storm. So, you know, um, it's just not, the slot is kind of more of an imaginary idea than, than a reality. Um, but in terms of the, the radiation belts, now the green zones, okay, these are where the most energetic of all the particles are both in the inner zone and the outer zone, okay? The inner zone is around L of two, give or take an ish, goes out to like about L of three and a half or so, maybe four, depending. Again, it kind of moves around a lot. And then the outer zone, as we saw, goes from about L of four-ish, give or take an ish, out to L of six to seven, you know, the hairy edge of the thing it begins to die out around, you know, the, the um, near geosynchronous orbit at 6.6 .6 RE. And these particles are the ones that really can slam right through spacecraft. These are the particles that we worry about um, damaging spacecraft, uh, both from surface charging, but also from penetrating all the way in and, and um, causing charge deposition, you know, charge deposits inside the electronics, inside thermal blankets, inside cables. I mean, there's just a ton of stuff that can be that, that these particles can do uh, to these spacecraft. Now, the inner zone, you often hear me call it the inner, a lot of people call it the inner zone. It's also the inner radiation belt, is mainly protons, mainly. There are some electrons, but it's mainly protons. Um, a lot of these particles are trapped in this ring that are galactic cosmic rays that come in, and there are different processes that cause them to get trapped in here. Um, crammed New, uh, neutron decay is one one way, and we also have anomaly. We have so we have galactic cosmic rays trapped in here, very very energetic particles, and which are mainly protons, like I said, and also um, anomalous uh, um, cosmic rays that come from different sources. Um, out here in the outer zone, mainly electrons. Are there protons? Yeah, a few. Yeah, but not nearly as much. It's the electrons out here in this outer zone that do most of the damage. And that's why surface charging is such a problem. Um, charging, right, comes mainly from electrons. It's a very, very fast process, very, very difficult and pernicious. Uh, as a matter of fact, surface charging probably causes two thirds of all of the satellite anomalies that we see in GEO, whereas 
you know, people think it's, oh, it's total radiation dose. No, not necessarily. It's more surface charging than radiation dose, to be honest, anymore. So we have a lot of different particle populations, as you can see. These are the main three, and they are co-located, but they all have slightly different effects when it comes to sp how space weather... Um, uh, or, let me say, let me put it differently. They all respond differently to space weather phenomena as, as space weather phenomena hit the Earth's magnetic system. And they all also create their own environment, little microcosm, little micro environment uh, in their various locales that have different, that cause different effects for space weather. So for instance, if you have a spacecraft in GEO, which is gonna be the outer edge of this radiation belt, you're going to be worried about surface charging and, yeah, total dose, but anything to do with electrons, okay? You're going to be worried about that kind of stuff a lot more than if you're down here in the inner zone. You're not going to be worried so much about surface charging because there's not as many electrons. What you're going to be worried about here are what are called single event effects because the protons, the bigger ions that actually hit your spacecraft, can cause memory upsets and bit flips and all sorts of things and can cause things like latch ups and single event upsets. And there's all sorts of things that, that can literally turn a command, make the spacecraft turn on its thruster and that fires off some crazy place and again gets lost or causes it to go into an uncontrolled spin. Or you have some super important thing that you're trying to you know talk to the ground, telemeter to the ground, and the, the, mem the, um, the, the single event effect ends up screwing up that communication because it messes up your telemetry. There's all sorts of things in, in this region that you'd worry about because of the radiation, the inner zone, that you wouldn't worry about so much out here. But there's a lot of stuff out here that you worry about because of the nature of this particle population that you worry about that you wouldn't worry about here. So automatically, this should give you a sense that depending upon what L shell you're at, depending upon what part of particle population you're experiencing, there is a huge difference in what you're going to see in terms of space weather in the nearest system. And so that whole concept of the sun throwing you eggs, that everybody in this near Earth space is going to suddenly see exactly the same thing at exactly the same time, <laughs> hopefully that blows that concept completely out of the water. Just this little bit of stuff that I've shown you on how complicated the Earth's magnetic system already is in terms of both magnetic field, right, and what's going on, and in terms of particles. And just wait till you get to see what these particles do <laughs> and how they move. This gets really cool. Okay, so I'm going to show a couple movies um, just for fun. And, and then I think, let me see here. What more do I want to talk about? Oof, do I really want to go into Earth's, syst Earth's current systems? Hmm. Hmm. Just thinking, just thinking. Um, now let me let me pause here. Let me let me let me wait. And if anybody has questions, please put them in the chat. I'll see if I can get to them. And I'm working on my other computer here to see. Yeah, I'm going to show you a few movies. So anybody have any questions in the chat? I'm going to quickly check Patreon to see if anybody has put any questions there. Really quickly. Oh, I don't have a Patreon thing up. Excuse me, guys, while you hear me click on, clicking away. So if anybody's a patron and they want to ask me a question, I am going straight to the Patreon post from today. Feel free to post there if you'd like. And I will keep that up from now on. Hi, Jack. I see you. Good afternoon. Sounding very clear. Thank you. I won't feel guilty. <laughs> Good. Yes, no overdriving at all. Good. How about a Mars question? Joseph, how does this differ from where Mars is? Would you be fried by radiation at the surface from flares? Yes. I mean, can we hear changes in the ring current on radio? Ah, yes. And I don't have that. Okay, so Joe's, Joe from Patreon has got given me some really good questions. What you can see already. What you can see already just from the particle populations and keep the, keep the, the um, whole concept of, um, 
of the else shells in mind, right? This doesn't exist at Mars. Mars has no radiation belts. Not at all. Mars doesn't have a ring current that I know of. Maybe it does. I don't think so. There's because no, it's a remnant field. I, I don't think it. Can, I don't think there's any stable orbits that particles can take around Mars. Now, especially with the solar wind slamming into the upper atmosphere of Mars, um, and and um, yeah, I don't think so. I don't think there's any stable bits. But I, I, if there's any magnetospheric physicists that that focus on Mars, please correct me. Um, but I don't think there is, because I, 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 as a matter of fact, as an undergrad, I did, it was one of the first papers I did. Uh, I actually did a, a magnetospheric study to see what the set, what the magnetic, the remnant magnetic field was on Mars as, as we, um, as, as one of the spacecraft went around it. Um, and I can't remember what spacecraft data it was. It was too long ago. My gosh, I'm old. Anyway, um. But the, the remnant magnetic field around Mars was just so, not chaotic, but it was chaotic enough that I don't think there's any stable um, particle orbits. And on top of that, I don't think Mars has a strong enough magnetic field to really jail a lot of, of um, particles in, in the Martian, in, you know, the Martian um, system. Really what it comes from is gravity, right? It's, it's really the ionosphere uh, and the upper atmosphere that is being held in because of the Martian gravity. So I think it's a good question, but um, I really don't think that there's any stable orbits. And, I, and so I think everything that you would hear um, or everything that's going on in the Martian system is, um, is gonna be very, very space weather related. So when particles slam into the, into, you know, from the solar wind, if the particles are slamming into the upper atmosphere, you know, you saw that from that very first diagram that I showed, it slams in really, really close to the, to the uh, Martian ionosphere. And it creates, a, you know, wreaks a lot of havoc. Um, on top of that, when you have radiation storms coming in, uh, that those radiation storms absolutely penetrate all the way to the surface. I mean, we see cosmic rays penetrating all the way to the surface, thanks to curiosity. So we know that um, the, the radiation dose on Mars, just from cosmic rays, let alone big solar energetic particle events, is massive. Uh, and that's going to be, that is going to be a huge thing to get over. Um, whether we like it or not, we are going to be living underground in Mars far more often than, we, than we'd like. And hopefully Artemis, the Artemis project will, is, is going to get off the ground, literally. <laughs> because if we can actually get humans on the moon with radiation detectors up there, we will get a good sense of how hard it's going to be to deal with that. Um, because we don't have any you know, we've not dug any holes on, on the moon to be able to, to live down there. Right now we just have habitats that are going to be up above ground. And the idea of having to go into one of these habitats to stay there for hours upon hours, um, psychologically, I think that's going to shred even the strongest uh, astronaut because um, it'd be like being in a coffin. You're in this water-walled coffin um, during a solar energetic particle event that could last days. What in the, I mean, how does any human handle that, right? I mean, we're just not built for that kind of thing. So I think it's going to give us a really sobering dose of reality when it comes to us wanting to colonize Mars, because it's, um, you know, it, it's just, I always say, it's just like campaigning for the presidency, right? The, the, the person who's campaigning for the presidency, all they care about is the campaign. And then once they get in, they're like, oh, now what? They don't plan for being in the presidency oftentimes. They just plan to get there. <laughs> and it's the same kind of thing with Mars. We All we all we focus on is getting there to, to such a great degree and worry about the cosmic rays out in space and the journey and la, 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 la. And once we get there, hey, we're great. It's wonderful. It's just like Earth. No, it's not. It's actually worse. So... Um, you know, there's there's a lot of things that we have to to really worry about, and that we're we're I think Artemis is going to help us out. You know, just simply because, um, you know, the moon is has got no atmosphere, and so particles are going to penetrate all the way in. And the moon is not always protected by the Earth's magnetic system. A lot of times, the moon is outside of the Earth's magnetic system, so it's not going to be you know it's going to be very much in that sense a a good laboratory for how space weather will affect people on Mars from that you know, from that perspective. Um, and hopefully that answered that question. And so um, 
regarding ring current and sounds and stuff like this. Yes, we will talk about that. Joe, so that, that's going to be probably a, a question for um, the next class because I will go into it. As a matter of fact, I'll even show you here. Um, the question is, um, can we hear things from the ring current? And we can hear lots of things. And here is a wonderful slide that I did not put together. And I need to put the, I'm going to put the um, credit for this slide. Uh, I, I'm surprised I don't have it on here. I need to put the credit for this slide on here. But as we will see, here is an Earth magnetic system looking down at the North Pole um, of the Earth here. And we're talking about fluctuations driven by waves. And I'm kind of just sitting out here. I'm just pushing this stuff. We've got all sorts of, of different types of waves. If I stand on this side, as you can see, we don't hear these types of things with our ears, but we hear them electromagnetically. And that's a spectrum that's, that's um, not a waterfall diagram, but you know, close enough, the same kind of idea. It's showing the spectrum of chorus waves and dawn chorus. I even have sounds of those um, that I'm not playing today, but I'll play them later. So we have those. We have plasma sphere kiss, which I'm now standing in front of. You can see it up here. These are waves that are generated uh, on what we call the dusk side of, of Earth. Here's emic waves. Whoops, I can stay, I'll still stay on this. Um, electromagnetic iron cyclotron waves. Again, another kind of uh, spectral diagram that shows you what they might sound like electromagnetically. And then we have other types of losses. So all and around from things like the ring current and things like the electron, you know, the radiation belts, all of these plasmas, all of the, and we call it plasma, all of the, um, the particle populations in and around these areas, uh, there's constantly losses happening. So you get, you get, you know, what we call sinks and sources, right? There's always source of these particles being, being um, injected into the, into the near earth system. And there's always losses and these losses often happen in terms of waves. And yes, some of these losses you can actually hear because they wiggle those L shells, right? And so you hear them, you end up electromagnetically hearing them. Uh, and we will, I will show, or I will demonstrate that kind of stuff. But that's getting ahead of ourselves. But hopefully, Joe, that wets your whistle. Because, yes, you are already getting very savvy and learning that electromagnetically on HF or other frequencies, we should be able to hear these things. And, yes, we do. We also hear them in space. So, um, yeah. And I've talked about that, too, in AKR. I think when we talked about radio bursts, and I went through, if you recall that class on radiation storms, not radiation storms, on radio bursts, solar flares and radio bursts, when we talked about a coronal mass ejection coming from the sun and then traveling all the way into the Earth's magnetic system, we talked about, you know, the microwave burst and we'd see the type threes and the type twos. And then we'd see the radiation, the storm type four storm radiation that would, that would come through. And then we saw it at the wind instrument, you know, the wind spacecraft right at L1, you saw where the shock hit wind and it created a, a um, kilometric radiation. And then you saw inside um, the Earth's magnetic system, all these really low frequency, um, kilohertz frequency um, noises, and it was just spattered all over the place. That's what we're talking about, is that same kind of stuff I just showed you. So yes, we do get those noises all the way inside. It's a very noisy place, the Earth's magnetic system is. And I think you're probably understanding how and why. So let me show you this movie. Whoop. Do that. Good. So this is just... This is very simple. I just wanted to show this to you, though, because I wanted you to see, whoops, I wanted you to see how those L shells are nested. So the yellow arrow is showing the Earth's sun line. OK, the blue arrow is showing south, um, probably the south magnetic pole, I believe. Um, but do you see those? Do you see all those field lines? Do you see the ones way out here? The ones that I almost can touch these ones out here. This is, you know, the, these are higher L shells. And then as you go into the Earth's system, they're lower L shells, right? But they're all slinkies. They're all, each one of them is like a slinky, like I've shown here, right? They're all slinkies. So then they just all wrap around Earth. But they're nested slinkies. Do you see how they're nested? Hopefully that gives you an idea. Now this is showing literally the, the heart of the Earth's magnetic system because the outside of the Earth's magnetic system isn't nearly this pristine, right? It's only the heart of the Earth's magnetic system that has slinkies like this. But you can imagine as this thing continues to rotate around how particles, how they are like nested particle accelerators in a sense, right? Each L shell 
Now, granted, there's an infinite number of, of magnetic field lines in between <laughs> these, these L shells. We, we are only, you know, saying L of one, L of two, meaning one Earth radii out, we're going to draw a line. Two Earth radii out, we're going to draw a line, okay? And we're calling those L shells. So yes, you can have an L 1.1 or an L 2.7. You can have an L 6. Oh, 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 six. I mean, you know, fine. The, that, that really is not the point. The, the reason why we have them kind of drawn out like this and, and spaced apart is so that it gives us a better mental picture of what we're looking at. But really, you can draw magnetic field lines in, in a continuum all the way out. Okay, so it's an infinite number of nested slinkies. But the, but the strength of the field in each of these drops off as you go to higher L shells because you're getting further and further and further away from the Earth. And it's, remember, it's the core, the iron dynamo, the iron core that's generating the field. So that's where the field is the strongest. And then anything going out past that gets, gets weaker and weaker and weaker, okay? Um, so hopefully that, that gives you a better feel for when I'm talking about slinkies and I'm talking about the nested slinkies. This gives you a feel for the way it is, essentially. Now, of course, what ends up happening when a space weather event hits, even, even in this system, even in the heart of the Earth's magnetosphere, is that the front end, if I can, actually, I should go over here, this side, right? Because now I'm trying to push, does my hand go? No, like this, maybe. <laughs> it's hard when I'm mirrored. <laughs> I'm so used to doing not mirrored that when I do it mirrored, it's a little tough. Okay, so here's the solar wind pushing woof, this way, because this is the Sun-Earth line. The, the yellow arrow is pointing at the sun, right? It's pointing at me. So as you move in and, and push as the solar wind, ugh, it compresses the front end of these slinkies, right? It actually pushes them in a little bit, makes that field a little bit stronger. And then in the back, in the tail, it actually stretches it all out. So these field lines would be pulled, ugh, 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 right? They'd actually be pulled out. So it compresses the front end and pulls out the back so that it becomes more like a comet tail, right? And that's really what the magnetic system looks like. But those pushes and pulls are far more um, prevalent, right, at higher and higher and higher L shells. So the further and further you get out, the, the more you see, I mean, the, the more effect that will have. So hopefully that gave you a good idea. Yeah, I guess I'll show this. Because I don't know if I want to show all that other stuff yet. So you get, what I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you one more movie. I hope this is the long version. This is a minute 12, so this, this will hopefully be enough. And I'm going to mute it because I think it's narrated, and you don't need the narrator. You've got me. <laughs> um, so before I even start this system, before I even start this system, this show, you should recognize this, right? Is this Mars? Is this Venus? No, it's Earth. Okay? And you should know that because you see that heart of that Earth's magnetic shield, right? You see that nice little, do you see the nested slinkies, just like we showed? Okay, Earth's magnetic field is tilted, right, relative to straight north, straight north this way, straight north that way, geographic north, I guess, and geographic south. That's off to the sun, right? Okay, so the solar wind is blowing in this way, right? And what you're seeing here, that little line that, be, that will become much more defined, ugh, terrible drawing, Tam, that line that becomes much more defined is the bow shock, okay? Blue will be low density, red will be high density, and you will see that solar wind coming in at a medium density, and then you'll see a storm hit. And you'll know it because you'll see suddenly everything go red, and you'll see this whole thing go boing, <laughs> right? You'll actually see that. Now, one of the other things that you'll see, because I believe this movie has it, is that you'll see magnetic field lines kind of running straight up and down, like this, straight up and down. That's gonna be solar wind magnetic field, and why they care about it is that it's running north and south. We're caring about basically southward magnetic field. Anybody who, who is savvy and knows how the Earth's magnetic field works knows that the Earth's magnetic shield, right, wraps northward on the outside, both in the, the, the tail and in the, the front. And it comes in at the poles, comes at the poles, the North Pole, get my hand in the right place. And the magnetic field goes straight down through the Earth's core and then comes back out, wraps around, was straight down, right? So at the Earth's front, what we call the subsolar region, that magnetic field points north. 
Anybody remember about magnetic reconnection? What does it take to be able to peel back one of these layers? What does it take to break one of these field lines and peel them back and add them to the tail? It's going to take magnetic field pointed the opposite direction of you. So if, you're, if the Earth's magnetic field is pointing northward, you need southward magnetic field from the sun or from the solar wind to then cause this magnetic, to, to then reconnect, cause this magnetic field line to break. Okay, we're breaking an L shell and we're gonna peel it back and you'll watch it and they'll place it. It'll, it'll, it'll fold back past the cusp and fold back this way. Okay, so watch that. So watch for springiness, okay? Watch for the flux peeling back, and sometimes it'll peel back this way. It'll actually reform. You'll see stuff from the lobe come back and reform and connect. Boop. And it'll be a new L shell out here. Okay, that's when things are recovering. The lobe field will come back and go flip and come back. Okay, and then it'll break and it'll peel back. It's kind of neat. It's kind of a neat little ballet that happens. This is, re you know, this is recovery. <laughs> this is storm. <laughs> recovery, storm. Hey, I'm creating a new, it's like the, 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 Funky chicken dance. This is recovery storm, recovery storm. <laughs> oh God, I can't believe I just did that. Oh, I'm such a fool. <laughs> Love me or hate me guys. Okay, you ready to see this movie? Here we go. So I'm gonna stand at the tail lobe. And what you're seeing again, is you're seeing this magnetic field. See, see it kind of bouncing in, seeing boom, 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 boom. You're seeing that if I stand on this side, you're seeing stuff kind of coming in in the solar wind, depending upon how dense it is, it's coming in going whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Ooh, look at that, boom, right? Ooh, look at that, bang. <laughs> Ooh, getting hammered. Do you see how springy? And now you're seeing it getting intense, really intense, right? Look how far in that magnetic field is going. Now look, it's loosening up, and now look at the, look at the magnetic field lines. Do you see how the flux is being either eroded from the solar wind and being pushed back toward the tail, folded back over the tail, or how the flux begins to come back? So you're seeing these L shells, these high L shells, not only are they being eroded and reformed very, very quickly, very, very fast, but there's a lot of activity going on, right? A ton of activity going on at these really high L shells, okay? We'll, we'll talk about the tail in a minute. But notice, even here, there's not a lot of movement in the heart of the Earth's magnetic system where the radiation belts are and all that kind of stuff. There's not a ton of activity. The L shells will shake, rattle, and roll, but they're not being peeled back, right? Let's play it again. They're not being peeled back. It's really the high L shells, okay? And where do those high L shells map again? They map the high latitudes, don't they? So in a sense, everything that's going on in these high L shells here, if I can get to it here, whoops, there's one, it just got peeled away. And of course the high L shells here that are getting distorted and slingshotted. See how they get distorted? Brrr, like I'm pulling, brrr, brrr. I'm pulling it out and then I let go, boing, and it goes shoop. When it goes forward and it becomes more like a dipole field, that's called dipolarization. See how the field is trying to get more dipolarized and get more like a pretty quiet system? That's when you know you have quiet magnetic field, quiet time. And then when a big storm hits, all that stuff of course starts getting elongated because all this flux is being put back into the tail and it's squeezing this tail down and it's loading it with more and more junk. The tail's getting heavier and thicker and thicker and thicker and so it just keeps pulling back until the point it can't handle it anymore and it, it breaks, shoots poop down the tail and shoots stuff toward Earth. Right at what we call the X line. Guys, remember the X line? We had the X line and you can actually see the X line. Oh, look, perfect. See an X line? See that? The tail of the Earth's magnetic system is being pulled out. See how it's being pulled out? Right, right? that's the slingshot. Now pull it back and we get to that X line, right? And we're gonna go cut and let go. And it's gonna go whoosh. And it forces all this stuff and all this junk. That's what do they do? All these particles 
follow the field lines. And they go up, 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 up. And they go, kunk. right, right in there. What's there? Can anybody say auroral ovals? <laughs> Can anybody say aurora? Yeah, get the idea? This is how we create aurora. Doesn't come from the front. It comes from peeling that flux back, forcing those magnetic field lines to come down, injecting energy, forcing those, those lobes, the tail lobes, to get closer and closer in the magnetic field, to get closer, closer and closer and closer and closer and closer, stretching it out, making those field lines, instead of being nice round, you know, pretty curved regions, pulling them back and making it, because then they come out this way and they come in this way, what's happening is that you're getting, if I get my hands in the right place, you're getting magnetic field again, guys, stretching out in opposite directions, getting super, super, super close to each other. What happens when you get magnetic field super, super close to each other in opposite directions? Come. Reconnection. Whew. Does that make sense? Hey, like a bullwhip, yep. That end, what happens when field lines nearly touch? Reconnection, right? Magnetic field does not like being close to its opposite. This is a very unstable configuration and it will reconnect and it will change everything. It will break just like the X lines that we talked about when we talked about coronal mass ejections being launched, right? Field lines that do this, that end up crossing, will end up reconnecting and you get two of them. So instead of having field lines that are coming out this way, let's see, right? The magnetic field in the earth in the dipole region over here, it comes out and goes up and then goes back in. So as you stretch that field line out, stretch it out further this way, you're getting field line that's going this direction in the southern part. And then of course it's wanting to curve back up. So the field lines that are going this way are, are this direction. And so as you get these two directions closer and closer together, right? You're getting opposite field, getting wanting ready to touch. And sure enough, in this model right here, this is where it's, the field lines are touching. And what happens is it reconnects here. So suddenly you get a field line that goes this way, right? It reforms this way. And then this one on this the other side reforms this way. So you get two, <laughs> two different curves. I can't do that. <laughs> Two different curves at this point. Oh, can't see. <laughs> and they go this way. This becomes a plasmoid that shoots down the tail. Whoosh. This becomes a dipolarized field line that retreats back up toward Earth and shoots particles both in the north and the south. We'll revisit this a lot. Ooh, it's getting hot in here. <laughs> uh, let me play this movie one more time. And I'm going to shut up and just let it play. If you have questions, please put them in the chat. I will try to address them as I, as I watch. That is how it reforms then, yes. And why it's not destroyed, right. Magnetic flux is neither created nor destroyed in that sense. It just reforms. And this is how we get um, how a magnetic system can survive in the solar wind. It becomes, it becomes a part of the solar wind system. The solar wind actually connects to it, and the solar wind continues to reform afterwards. And I, I should have a really neat video that shows how down the tail, as we go all the way down that tail, how those, you can see those field lines. Do you see how they're almost straightening out? Do you see how they're almost straightening out? Right? They're kind of bent like this. As you get further and further down the tail, those field lines become less bent, and they become straighter and straighter and straighter. And if you get far enough down the tail, you will have field lines that are straight up and down again, just like the ones in front. So you have straight lines coming in, magnetic field lines. They get all messy through this magnetic system, and then down the tail, they reform and they're straight again, like nothing happened. So in the grand scheme of things, in the bigger picture that is the solar system, these planets only make like little, tiny little pockets of messed up magnetic field. And then th that's why the heliosphere, the whole magnetic system and the Parker spiral and all that kind of stuff, it's just these little holes that are punched through it and they kind of get reconfigured for a short while. And then when the solar wind passes through, it just passes through and it's okay. And everything's re re reformed. And what started as straight magnetic field lines up and down north-south ends up as straight magnetic field lines north-south afterwards. 
Okay. So amazing. I love our universe. Isn't it cool? This is why I stopped reading science fiction books and actually picked up textbooks. Because it was just like, wow, this is just so cool. <laughs> okay, Jack, let's see on Twitter, I mean on uh, Patreon. Curious how the ring current vibration effect changes the propagation layers. Do they just disappear, obliterate, change intensity and altitude? Um, all the above. And we'll get that in. When we talk about regime two, you're getting way ahead of me. <laughs> you're an amateur, amateur radio operators. You have to wait for it, wait for it. Because it, in order to get to regime two, which is the ionosphere, in order to get to that regime, we must learn this, right? We must learn L shells. We must learn this stuff. And I'll show you why in a sec. Because it has everything to do with current systems and it has everything to do with how particles propagate down into the upper ionosphere. Um, and so we will, re we will be returning over and over and over again. And, and you, you probably are already seeing that, right? Because now you already understand high L shell versus low L shell. And, uh, and I'm not going to show you the Carrington event today. I was thinking I was going to show that next, but I'm going to save that one. That's a cool one. So imagine this same model, but with a much stronger storm, right? You saw just kind of a cute little boom, 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 boom. But imagine when you can peel back a ton of this flux, right? Instead of just peeling back the last couple field lines here at the very edge, at very high L shells, imagine what happens if you could peel the flux, oh, I don't know, kind of further in. <laughs> Be pretty cool, huh? Yeah. That's, that's what big storms do. The super storms do that. Okay. So, Jack, I, I, as much as I'd love to answer your question, I am, I'm going to save the details of that question for later because of that. Um, I want to see, whoops. I think I will go ahead and mention disturbed current systems, but we have, we're already at the two and a half hour mark, so I'm probably going to stop this here pretty quick. Let me see if anybody has any other questions. Looks like everybody's understanding this. This is great. Let's see. Um, the, at the end, what happens when the field's, okay, yeah, I already did that. Hit like a bullet, reconnection. Think that's how it forms, revent. Yep. And why it's not destroyed. When this X occurs, is there an energy balance? Yes. Yes, it absolutely is. Um, magnetic energy and then thermal energy and plasma energy. I mean, there's all sorts of energies and, and pressure balances and, um, yeah, and wave propagation. There's all sorts of things that go on. And that's a very complicated question. But yes, it's all fighting to create an energy balance. Absolutely. Always trying to, to shed the excess energy, always trying to get to the lowest energy point. It's always trying to do that. Um, and you'll see that as part of why waves are created. Um, when we talk about like emic waves and things like that. Okay, now I can visualize how powerful it needs to be to break the Elsha that brings Aurora to lower latitudes. Yes, exactly. That's exactly right. Chris asks, is the energy level the same in, in each direction at the break point? It depends upon... Hmm, that's a tough one. Yes and no. Um, because it depends on what energy you're talking about. Because... If you're total energy, yes. Um, if it's you're looking at magnetic energy or if you're looking at, at speed of the plasma jets, probably not. Um, and also reconnection isn't, it's, it's done in a very corpuscular way. Very, very, this is something that MMS, the spacecraft MMS are really trying to learn. Um, reconnection is very, very touchy and very, very hard to understand when you get down to the very tiny, you know, the, the very specifics of it. Um, and, and so, Yes, in, in a general sense, I will say yes, but as you get to finer and finer levels of detail, the answer is no, that begins to break down. And, and I'll leave it at that because that is, a, that is like way beyond my, my um, expertise. Remember, I'm not a magnetospheric physicist. And that is just one reconnection. You can actually call them reconnection physicists because there's some people who spend their entire lives just doing reconnection, just talking about what happens at those X points. Um, Mandy, wow, do I understand this? Cool. And Nick, oh, really cool stuff. Oh, good, Nick. I'm so glad to see you here. Magnetic field becomes a compressed sponge. Yes, this is so cool. Good. I'm so glad you guys, Mandy, you, you're understanding it. Uh, alchemical, al al alchemical spirit. Thank you. So amazing. I love our universe. Yes, I, it's so wonderful, isn't it? Um, Fred asks, how, wait, why does magnetic storms cause problems for the U.S. and Canada? Oh, that's getting into the ground regime. Now, that's regime three. Come on, wait for it. <laughs> It's um, it has to do with the bedrock. 
it causes problems for us on the ground, especially in power systems, because of something called geomagnetically induced currents. Remember, electric, electric, electric fields and current systems are connected with magnetic systems. You can't have one without the other, especially when they move. To move an electric field generates a magnetic field. To move a magnetic field generates an electric field. And they both can generate currents in that sense. So it's all kind of packed together. And so when you imagine this magnetic field of our Earth changing and moving, it's going to induce currents on the ground. Um, and that's basically because we have conductivity in our rocks, at the, in our bedrock. So you can already imagine how bedrock, depending upon the, the, the makeup, right, the composition of our bedrock, if something is more conductive, then you're going to get bigger currents. If something is less conductive, you're going to let less currents. Um, and, and so certain bedrock then has a huge play in whether or not you're going to have problems with your power grid. And we'll see that when we get to ground, ground based stuff, but I won't do that in, in out here because we're still out in, in, in the near earth space system. Okay. Let's see. Need to watch earlier discussion about the L shells. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Nick, please. Definitely check the L shells because that's that's a critical critical component. If you don't get the L shells, and and as I mentioned in the when I talk about L shells, just get the idea of the L shells because we are going to revisit it. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm going to show you a, a, a slide here in just a second that gives you an, a, a feel for what we're going to talk about in our next installment. Um, okay, I've seen what looks like the solar wind reversing on this diagram. Norwin, what do you what do you mean? Are you talking about the the magnetic field lines coming? Oh, oh, you're talking about the solar wind going backwards? No, what you're looking at, and maybe I didn't explain it. What you're looking at is the density of the solar wind, not the velocity of the solar wind. The solar wind is blowing by the Earth in case of a storm, sometimes 600 kilometers a second. Trust me, there's no reversal. If it reversed, here's how you'd know. You know how you'd know? If the solar wind reversed, this magnetic tail would not be the magnetic tail. The magnetic tail would be on the other side, right? Think about it. Like a comet, right, being, you know, or a flag, right? It's going to blow away from the direction of the wind. If the wind is blowing this way, that flag is flapping in the breeze like this, okay? This magnetic tail is the flag, okay? Solar wind's coming this way, flag blows away. If the solar wind were to reverse in this model, we could probably do that. If this, if this model, the solar wind, were suddenly to reverse, this tail would go short, shorten, stop, and then start blowing this way. Okay? That's how you know. So, no, the, the solar wind is always blowing that way. What you're looking at is density. So, what you're seeing is this thing buffeting. And it's not really reversing. It's just the magnetic shield taking a, 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 you know, taking a blow and then recovering. Taking a blow and then recovering. The solar wind is always blowing by. Okay? That recovery is the Earth's magnetic system exerting itself against the solar wind. But it's not exerting itself against the solar wind in the sense that it's um, making the solar wind go the other way. It's like you standing in against a strong wind and the wind goes, Whoa, and it knocks you back. And you're like, Gah! and you take a step forward. Well, you didn't just reverse the wind by taking that step forward. The wind has been blowing you back. It's just that you're fighting against it and you get strong enough to go Ugh, and push yourself against that wind. This wind's still blowing this way. So think of it as the same kind of thing as you blowing against a really strong wind and sometimes you get those gusts that push you back and then you recover and you regain your balance and you continue to push against it. Wind's still blowing, okay? So the solar wind does not reverse. If the solar wind reversed, the lights would go out. <laughs> Our star would be very dark. <laughs> um, that's all I can say. Um, because if the sun starts sucking in wind, we're in trouble. <laughs> uh, yeah, the star ceases to be a star. I, I'm not exactly sure what it would be, but we'd be in real trouble. Um, and, and the fact that the wind reversed would be just the beginning of our troubles. <laughs> that would be the least we'd have to worry about. We'd be worried about our star collapsing, uh, sucking everything in, becoming a black hole. No, no, no. Let's not go there. <laughs> so, so yeah, I think we'll, we'll have a big hint. We'll see a lot more warnings prior to our sun, our, our, our solar wind reversing direction. We'll, we'll know it long in advance. Um, okay. So let's see. Any other questions, guys? Um, I'll show you one other thing before we quit today. I hope you found all. Oh, thank you, Fred. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, I, I need my, I need my family member home. That's for sure. Um, 
okay, it's just amazing that everything works in formation to make us survive on this earth. I know, isn't it? It's just a, that's why I call it a ballet. It's just so en enchanting. And I want, I want to, to bring that home to you, to let you know what your backyard is really like. This is your backyard, guys. Pretty cool backyard, don't you think? I want it to be yours. I want you to have that backyard as your own when you look up at the sky and you realize what your backyard really is, especially with Starlink going up, right? I mean, we need to understand this more. I was just talking to Bill Murtaugh the other day about from Swipsy. He's the director of Swipsy at the Space Weather Prediction Center. And he was talking about how Swipsy's um, priorities are changing because of Elon Musk, because of, Star, of, of um, Starlink, that thank God, finally, they're going to get drag models. They're going to put a much more strong emphasis on understanding our, our upper atmosphere and, and how much drag uh, on low Earth satellites um, are, is a problem. Because I've been suffering with that. I've wanted that for so long. And with Starlink, it's going to be critical. So I'm so pleased that he told me that the other day. That's something that, that they're going to get up soon as a data product. Um, Norn, I used to check the in spiral every day very few times, but it looked like it reversed. Yeah, I get it. It's not, it's not, it really isn't. It's, it's, the, in, the solar wind is always blowing out. And it, what you're looking at when things go back and forth, you're looking most likely at these magnetic field lines. And it's, it's, um, if you look at uh, when I start talking about the heliosphere and the current sheet in those mini courses, I talk about the inlow spiral and what that those sp that spiral means and what you're actually seeing. So I've got a pretty good explanation there. I don't know if I talk directly about solar wind reversal, but I do talk about why those magnetic field lines go back and forth. It really has to do with the speed of the solar wind. The the speed of the solar wind when it's faster, those spirals arms are are much more relaxed. They're not as spirally. They don't. They're not as tight as spiral. But when the mag, when the um, solar wind speed is slow, those spiral arms, those magnetic field arms, um, are are sp spiraling more tightly. And so when in Enlil, when you're seeing that magnetic field line going back and forth, it's not that the solar wind is going back and forth. It's just that the fast wind means the 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 spiral opens up, and then as the wind slows down, the spiral arm closes back up. So it looks like there's a reversal, but it's really not. It's just how the magnetic field line is drawn in, in the changing speed of the solar wind from 600 or 700 kilometers a second to, you know, slow as like three, 300 kilometers a second. But trust me, it's still blowing out from our sun. But I, I completely understand, and I'm glad you brought that point up, because it helps me understand how these data products are confusing to non-experts. And that's important. We've got to figure out how to, how to make these things more clear and more understandable, because it is understandable. There's nothing about them that is not under, understandable. It's just simply a matter of figuring out how to express it the right way. Okay. Um, electric universe is dreamer perspective and not science for sure. Yeah, I, you know, electric universe, there's a lot of positives about electric universe, but there's, there's the magnetic field too. <laughs> And we can't forget about that. And then there's the neutral atmosphere too. And we can't forget about that. So there's a lot of things that don't fit into the electric universe paradigm um, that are being omitted, probably for simplicity. And so I'm happy with the electric universe people because they like to look at the big system. They like to look at big pictures and the coupling between regimes. And that helps us. That helps us in the sense that it forces across pollination, yes, and, and across disciplinary um, studies, but it oversimplifies things. And so we have to be very careful how we do those things. So there's there's always good and the bad, but overall, anybody who's looking at space weather and how it works is, is a, a positive to me. Okay, so let's see. Um, what, what channel did I tune into? I don't, know. I don't know. Oh goodness, I have a, I'm sorry, part of my ring light is, I never, never noticed that. It was bothering the bottom here. Now it's bothering the other side. Sorry, guys. The whole the whole video has been like this. Um, okay, it looks like I got most of the questions. I'll get more in a minute. So what I wanted to show you before we quit today, because I have got to get off the the channel here in a, I mean the, the feed here in a few minutes. Um, why it's only been three hours? <laughs> is it, I, I've got to give up the studio to my husband, who's who's teaching a class here in a second. Um, what I wanted to talk about just a little bit here is why these L shells are important when it comes to par particle populations, right? We talked about, and I'll flip over to here now. Um, we've talked about these, 
these particle populations, right? And we're going to start getting into the details of that here pretty quick. And let me show you how. Here's an ugly diagram. Imagine, let me stand on the side. Imagine if you had no idea what an L shell is and I showed you this. <laughs> First of all, do you even recognize what this is? Okay. Oh, here's, here's a hint. Solar wind <laughs> coming in from the side. Okay. It is, believe it or not, that's an Earth's magnetic system. This is a very, very, very famous diagram. That's very, very old, actually, and has been repeated in so many journal articles, I can't even tell you. Here is the, the front end of it. Here is what we call the sol subsolar point, right, where the, sol the solar wind comes in and hits right essentially the equator of, of where the Earth's system is. Um, you can see these are magnetic field lines that are going up, right? They're northward pointing because that's the Earth's magnetic system. You can see Earth, I put my hand in the right place, here, okay? You can see the magnetic field, kind of the magnetic field lines, right? So what we've done is we've taken the cut that comes down through the North Pole, halfway to the, to the equator, it's a vertical cut, and then we turn the knife sideways and we cut out through the equator that way. So it's this pie slice that we've kind of cut, chunk, chunk. Okay, right, shunk, and then shunk. So in the top part, you see the cusp. If I get my hand in the right place, right there. Okay, cusp, and then you see the inner, the heart of the, of the Earth's magnetic system is all in here. And then you see the equatorial region, which is this flat cutout, okay. There's the tail all the way down that way, okay. And of course, here's the front. And the outside of this is the magneto sheath, the magneto pause, where everything's being folded over. Okay. Looky. <laughs> See all the colored lines? These are all current systems, right? And what are they caused by? They are caused by the particle populations in different locations. For example, there's the ring current. Okay. The ring current travels in a ring equatorially around the Earth. Okay. Now, Anybody who was paying attention knows that the ring current, as we call it, going westward, this is what we call going westward, that's the sign of a positive charge carrier. So therefore, electrons are going the opposite direction. <laughs> Yay, thank you, physicists. Thank you. Thank you for your conventions. That's just great. Electrons control the bulk of the current, but, you know, the ring current goes this way. Yeah, okay. Electrons go in the opposite direction. Okay. But the ring current is, that's the main energy of the system, but it's not the only system, right? Not the only ring, not the only current system we have. Here's another one. Field aligned currents, right? Region one and region two, and we will talk about them a lot more than or in in uh, in the ionosphere part, but we'll talk about them a little bit here. Notice how far out they are. They actually go, especially region one, the blue one. Oops, let me go to the blue one. See how far it goes out? It goes out to the edge of the Earth's magnetic system. What does that mean? In terms of L-shell, hopefully you say high L-shell, right? High L-shell. How does, because it's at the edge of the Earth's magnetic system, way out there being trashed by the solar wind, right? And what does that mean when you map it back down to Earth? High latitude, right? Sure enough, if you map that thing if I can follow my fingers all the way do, 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 to the Earth's upper atmosphere, right here, we're talking about really high latitude. As a matter of fact, the edge of the auroral oval. And everything that's inside of that, that's actually higher latitude than where this, field current, this current system is, is actually open magnetic field to the solar wind. It's no longer the closed magnetic system that is Earth's system. In other words, its L shell is so high, it maps to the solar wind. That's why you get this open region near the North Pole and in the South Pole, same thing, that is open. Why radiation storms are such a pain in the butt when you fly over the poles, because the L shells, quote unquote, if there were such a thing, would map to the solar wind, right? The L shells are so high, they're broken. They're open to the solar wind. Get it? Now, region two is actually the bottom part of that auroral oval system, it maps slightly inside. Doesn't map to the edge, just slightly in. Lower L shell. Rain current, look, on the inside of that, even lower L shell. And then there are current systems that go, you know, we, we can continue with this, with this process as we talk about other current systems, where they map. 
Okay. And then there's coupling with the neutral atmosphere and all sorts of other cool stuff that creates other ways of, of, of taking some of this current and these current systems and kind of propagating it down to even lower latitudes. So this is why hopefully you get an understanding immediately why I need to, you to have at least a cursory understanding of L shells before we even begin to start talking about how the dynamics are controlled in the Earth's magnetic system, because that's all we're going to be talking about is L shells and latitudes, magnetic latitudes, okay? So hopefully that gives you a nice little hint as to what's coming when we talk about current systems, because it gets very, very interesting from this point on. And with that, I think I will open up for one last set of questions. Um, and I will, well, no, I'll keep this slide on, but I can play the movie again in the background if you want. If anybody wants me to play the movie, I will, I will play it again. So what do you guys think? Was this, was this clear as mud? <laughs> I want so bad to see the Northern Lights. Fred, you and me, me both. I've never seen them with my own eyes. So I need, I need to do that before I die. It's a bucket list thing. Hey, Tamitha, the space vehicle that was supposed to study the ionosphere was launched a year or so ago. Is there data from it yet? Which space vehicle? There's a ton of space vehicles that were launched that were that have been launched to, to study the ionosphere. Um, give me a name. Because yeah, uh, probably. And lots of rocket stuff too. I think I get it. Good. Thank you. I'm so glad, Nolan. Um, is the speed of the wind related to the diameter of coronal holes? Ah. Yes and no. Not directly, but yes, because the, the larger a coronal hole is, the um, the deeper it can be, right? And the more fast wind can hit. Um, really, what you worry about is not just the speed of the coronal hole, but how or speed of the solar wind that comes from the coronal hole, but also how how long duration those those the speed of that, I mean, how long duration that fast solar wind stream is. Because that's what really, it's the sustaining of that stuff that actually can create really strong geomagnetic storms. Remember, Earth doesn't. Earth can handle pretty much anything if it's just you know one and done, where it's in and out and it's done. Earth's magnetic system just goes, oh, it, that's not a big problem. The problem is when the stuff gets sustained and you just keep flooding the Earth system with energy, over and over again. Right? If I play this again, just even with this mild storm going behind me, you can imagine the more stuff as I walk out of the frame, the more stuff that is being piled in into the Earth's magnetic tails, or the Earth's magnetic tail lobes, which is all that blue, the more energy that gets pumped into that area, the, the, you know, the more energy that ends up getting shot, shunted up toward the Earth's magnetic, um, you know, toward the heart of the Earth's magnetosphere. See how the blue disappears when there's lots of energy? But the blue will recover, which means low density, right? That's the tail lobes recovering. Right, see so here, you can see how big the tail lobes are, it's because the, the solar wind is very quiet now. But for a while, you saw all that blue go away. And that was because there was a lot of energy being pumped into that system and it wasn't being able to be shed. So it's really duration that, that is a, a, a huge issue. Okay, so um, I've seen the auroras a lot in northern Wisconsin. Yes, yes, and we will see a lot more of them soon. Uh, especially as the as we actually get real real storms again, we haven't had any really great storms in in a while. Okay, so it looks like you guys have pretty much you know looks like we've got all the questions answered. If Earth lost its magnetic field, how long would it take for things to go bad? That is a really good question, and that's actually more for climatologists and maybe Martian um, magnetist or Martian planet. Um, planetary ge geophysicists to answer than me. Um, but we do believe that the Mars, um, the interesting thing about the dynamos I mentioned earlier, is that we are at a really unique time in our iron core's history. Our iron core is essentially an iron slushy. It's part solid and part liquid. And because of that, there's a lot of dynamics that are, that are occurring that then create the dynamo. Um, and in Venus, we believe the and I'm not going to go into details because I don't have time. But in Venus, we believe that the iron core is still completely liquid. In Mars, we believe that the iron core has finally cooled to the point where it's completely solid. And that's why neither Venus nor Mars have a dynamo, an active dynamo right now. Venus was our past when Earth was still hot. And so 
it, there wasn't that the iron core wasn't cooling enough to, to begin to solidify. And so we didn't have that slushy kind of uh, thing with our iron core. And so there was no dynamo then. But as the core of our of our planet has cooled, we we're beginning to find we're forming bits, you know, sol solid bits that then float to the surface of the iron core. Um, no, excuse me. <laughs> I'm thinking ice. Um, the iron, the iron parts that are solidifying sink to the to the core, the very core of the Earth, where it's hotter. They re melt and reliquify, and then that convection, you know, they begin to rise to the surface again, where the cooler bits sink down and remelt, and you know, and then you get this convection pattern going. As long as that goes, that's going to create our dynamo. Once we get to the point where there's where the iron core has really become solid enough that the convection can't happen anymore, it's mostly all sort of solid iron, we're going to start losing our magnetic field. And when we do that, um, we're going to have a situation very much like Mars, where basically the atmosphere is going to start being blown off by the solar wind, and the oceans are going to start evaporating to replenish that atmosphere, and then it's going to get blown off again. And you know the oceans will sublimate, and eventually we'll lose our water planet. And our atmosphere will become very thin and will be very much like Mars. So the Mars looks like it's going to be our future. Interesting, huh? So um, uh, how long that takes? Uh, I don't know. It's not, I, a little bit out of my expertise. Hmm. Mandy, this is a minor storm that you're looking at in this, this movie. This was a minor storm, not a major one. I'll show you a major storm next time. Guaranteed. Uh, when was the big power outage? March of, of 1989. Yeah, Quebec. That was the March of 1989, March essentially 6th through the 15th. We will talk about that. I will actually, when we get to the ground regime, I'll actually show you um, some of the Kappaman analysis. Um, if you are if you want to jump ahead, look at Metatech, M-E-T-A-T-E-C-H, and um, John Kappaman, C-A-P-P-E-M-A-N, Kappaman. Um, the analysis he did back in like 2008 is part of what caused space weather policy to radically change um, in the United States and ab abroad. Uh, he helped kickstart some of that, and it was all an analysis of the power grid susceptibility to space weather based on that 1989 storm. Really wakes you up big time. Um, the colors and snapping sounds were amazing. Yeah, yeah. Aurora has. There's some other neutral atmosphere th phenomena that occur with aurora that cause the sounds. Aurora, where everything is collisionless, doesn't actually make the sounds. But there's some coupling down into the neutral atmosphere where acoustic waves can actually make noise. So I, I don't think anybody understands that yet. But too many people have seen it for it not to be real and hear, heard it for it not to be real. Yes, our core is a lava lamp, very much like the sun's. You know, the sun can be a lava lamp too. So. Okay, guys, this is great. Um, let's see, Wade Clark asks, what causes the large deep red aurora? Oh, that's just storm time aurora, like what happened in the early 2000s. Oh, we'll get it again. As a matter of fact, high latitudes get it all the time. Uh, red aurora is from oxygen. It's one of the absorption lines in oxygen. And so uh, we don't usually see that unless there, we've got some higher energy particles coming in. And so um, typically oxygen lines, oxygen is green uh, aurora at the quiet time, but you can light it up in, or in, in red. As a matter of fact, you can get rainbow aurora where you're getting all sorts of colors. Um, nitrogen is where the blue comes from. Um, but oftentimes I always call red aurora storm aurora because you very rarely see it unless there's a big geomagnetic storm hitting. And that's why you see it. But it happens quite often actually. And then all sorts of other colors are... Um, all, all sorts of other colors are coming from the combination of, you know, the red and the green and the blue and stuff like that. So you can get pinks and purples and oranges. All right, let me see one other question. Um, oh, no, okay, I've got it. I think I'm going to check Patreon one more time. I thought I saw a new question there, but I don't think I did. Um, good, guys. Uh, lovely. Um, oh, Icon. Um, I do believe... I do believe we have data from ICON. I would have to check and get back to you on that. Let me see. Jack did write me another question. Um, this helps a bunch of space weather related concepts for me. I tend to jump ahead because visualizing one part makes me wonder about the effects of another part. I love it. Yes. Oh, that's so great, Jack. I'm so gr I'm, I'm grateful. I'm glad I'm helping you make sense of it all. And yes, jumping ahead is very, very cool. Okay, guys, I am going to have to leave. Um, I just got the cue. <laughs> Get off the stage, he said. And uh, thank you so much. Um, 
and you know we will pick up where we left off and and go into radiation belts and go into current systems and start talking about other things like space um, like effects on satellites and all sorts of other cool and particle motion we'll get into the adiabatic invariance next and so you'll be able to understand how these particles really move in these very complicated magnetic fields and it'll be a lot more fun it'll be even crazier than this one was okay all right guys so i'll see you next time okay